In this world, there have been many, and I mean many, instances of people who have truly never existed leaving their mark on this world. Whether it have been through stories, rumors, games, or more, these non-existent people and identities have cultivated either much fame, interest, or mystery. And in this video, I'll be going over many of these people in the non-existent iceberg. Due to the amount of information behind a lot of the entries and the sheer amount of them, this iceberg will be broken up into parts. And with that being said, if you enjoy content such as this, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe in order to support the channel. And now, let's get into it. J.R. Hartley J.R. Hartley is a fictional character created for a memorable advertising campaign by the British Yellow Pages in the 1980s. This advertisement features this old dude, this is J.R. Hartley, who is on a quest to find a book about fly fishing, and he gets frustrated because he can't find a book using the traditional methods of that time. So he turns to the Yellow Pages and eventually finds his book. Now, I'm not doing the advertisement justice as it's one of those wholesome, heartwarming stories. However, I'm here to give you guys information and that's what I'm doing. Also, fun fact, this commercial is also known for its tagline, I'm J.R. Hartley and I'm looking for a book on fly fishing. I never heard it before, but then again, I'm from the US. Oshan. So Oshan is a legendary figure in the Celtic mythology and he's been celebrated for a long time due to his poetic prowess and the beauty of his tales. According to the lore behind Oshan, he was a great warrior and poet, often depicted as the son of the legendary Irish hero, Finn McCool. And his poetic compositions are known as the Songs of Oshan these songs of Oshan being said to be filled with both the melancholy of lost love and the heroic deeds of his fellow warriors. The mystique surrounding Oshan is only brought up even higher due to controversy over the authenticity of his works. Because in the 18th century, Scottish poet James McPherson claimed to have translated these ancient poems from the Gaelic manuscripts, sparking debates about their origins. And some believed in their authenticity, however, there were people who obviously doubted McPherson's claims, considering the poems to be his own creations. Despite the controversy that every famous person deals with, Olshun's influence has endured over time and has left an indelible mark on Celtic literature and inspired generations of writers. Lemony Snicket So Lemony Snicket is a weird and kind of elusive character in the literary world. Known for his involvement in the series of unfortunate events that befall the Baladair orphans. And he's also the narrator and supposed author of a series of unfortunate events. That's also the title name. Snicky takes on the role of an investigative and mysterious figure. And he often appears to be on the fringes of the story, sharing his insights into the misadventures of the Baladairs. He does have a lot of style though, as he's dressed in a nice, distinctive, all black ensemble with a typewriter. Lemony Snicket is also a master of wit and wordplay. The guy just does it all. He's pretty cool. But when he tells the story of, you know, a series of unfortunate events, he kind of weaves the narrative with tragedy and dark humor, keeping the story quite engaging as you read it through. I recommend reading it because the character himself just adds like another layer to the series. It's hard to articulate, but if you were to read the story, you'd pick up on what I'm saying. Alan Smithy. So Alan Smithy is an imaginary person who has quite an interesting backstory in the world of filmmaking. When you see Alan Smithy is the director of a movie, that's just a stand-in because the director who made said movie was not happy with how their project turned out, so they don't want their name on it. So the idea is to essentially maintain a professional anonymity while expressing dissatisfaction with the final outcome. And nowadays, it's just like an inside joke in the movie business, and it represents like all the challenges and complexities that comes with making a movie. So if you ever see that, just know that the director you know, did not like the movie as much as you didn't like it because, you know, nowadays everybody hates every movie. So yeah, simply put, he's just a symbol of artistic frustration. Kilroy. Kilroy is often depicted as a bald-headed man with a big nose peering over a wall. He's, he's basically like an iconic and whimsical character that gained popularity during World War II. 
you know, like Kilroy was here. Have you ever seen that picture? Well, it's going to be on the screen. It's become a pretty funny and mysterious symbol among soldiers and civilians alike. Even nowadays you see it, well, I don't know about nowadays, but I'm sure I saw it when I was younger. The origins of Kilroy and this joke are a little bit hazy and there are many theories that surround this character's creation. It's believed that the phrase in the doodle spread as a form of graffiti among servicemen appearing in unexpected and hard to reach places. Kilroy's presence was a source of amusement and camaraderie amongst troops and allowed them to connect with one another during these challenging times. And over the years, like I said earlier, he's transcended his relevance. He's still around nowadays. I know I saw him as a kid at least like 10 years ago. I don't know if you're going to see him in 2023. Times have changed. Betty Crocker. So Betty Crocker is a fictional character in this instance associated with the world of cooking and baking. If you know General Mills, she's like the personification of the company's home cooking and baking. Like, she's that lady that they put on their products. She's often depicted as a friendly and knowledgeable woman who offers cooking advice for the youngsters. And her image has changed and evolved over the years. You know how, like, every mascot gets their image changed to match the times. That's what's going on with her. And she's become a beloved and trusted figure in American households. Again, probably not nowadays, but she certainly was before because I remember my mom talking about her once. The lady has been featured in cookbooks, radio shows, television commercials. People should know who this lady is. She's She's been around for a while. Little Johnny. So for this entry specifically, I'm going to have pictures of this kid named Little Johnny from his own TV show. But it, this is not what I'm talking about. Kind of is, but he's a reference to the Little Johnny that I'm going to be speaking about here. So the Little Johnny character, the real one, is a fictional character that's often used in jokes and anecdotes particularly in the context of like childhood innocence and or cheeky behavior. And the thing with the little Johnny jokes is that they don't have like a necessary formula. They just either have to be him being more smart than he should be or him being more adult than he should be. For example, there's one joke, I'll read it, where it's the teacher saying, does anybody know what we call a person who keeps talking when nobody else is interested? And then little Johnny responds saying, a teacher. And yeah, that's one of the jokes, but there are so many, and I think it varies from person to person whether the little Johnny character is going to be mischievous, um, naive, etc. But that's kind of just how it goes. A kid making a joke that an adult should be making. J.T. Leroy. So J.T. Leroy is a literary figure created by the author Laura Albert in the late 1990s and early 2000s. J.T. Leroy gained attention for the purported autobiographical works, including novels like Sarah, and the heart is deceitful above all things. The persona of J.T. Leroy was presented as a young, troubled, multi-gendered individual who had experienced a tumultuous life. Laura Albert, the real writer behind J.T. Leroy, kept her identity a secret for several years, allowing the public to believe that this J.T. Leroy was a real person. And she was able to maintain this illusion through just, you know, making up phone calls, public appearances that didn't look like Laura Albert, obviously, in interactions with celebrities that were reported by the public and seen by the public. She just did a very good job with basically fooling everybody. And she also was involved with the film adaptation of The Heart is Deceitful Above All Things. She did, she basically finessed everybody here. But there was a revelation that JT Leroy was a literary hoax, and it caused a crazy stir in the literary word, apparently. Despite the controversy surrounding the persona's creations, people still will talk about JT Leroy to this day. And Santa Claus. Guys, you guys know who Santa Claus is. We're not going over this. And with that, we finish off Tier 1, and let's get into Tier 2. Starting off Tier 2 with Araki Yasusuda. Araki Yasusuda is a fictional Japanese poet who sparked a literary scandal in the 1990s. And this was masterminded by American literature professor Kent Johnson. Major journals like the American Poetry Review unwittingly published Yasusuda's poetry, causing embarrassment when the truth emerged. Why this and caused embarrassment? Well, it's real messy. It's because Yasusuda's fictional biography painted him as a survivor of the Hiroshima atomic bomb born in 1907 and a conscripted soldier in World War II. And I mean, if you know, that's a big no-no. 
The discovery of his poems and notebooks by his son in 1991 marked their publication, presenting a captivating but entirely fabricated narrative. And what I mean by this is his son discovered Yasusuda's books and published them. And when it comes to Ken Johnson, Ken Johnson was thought to be the real writer, but he never admitted authorship. He only admitted that he edited Yasusuda's texts. There's conflicting responses about the true identity of this writer and rumors of co-authors adding even more complexity to controversy. And despite all of this controversy and backlash, there were even some critics who praised the conceptual nature of the fiction and the quality of the writing with Roof Books publishing the entire text in 1997. Allegra Coleman. So Allegra Coleman is actually quite the unique entry in this iceberg. I would even say that she can be at the very bottom. This is how her story goes. So in 1996, Esquire magazine ran a feature article about a supposed rising Hollywood star. This is Allegra Coleman. And the elaborate hoax had like a detailed profile had a complete biography, filmography, and even a whole fabricated interview. She was portrayed as an actress with a meteoric rise to fame, starring in many blockbuster films and garnering attention for her beauty and talent. The hoax was so convincing that it had fooled almost every reader and sparked widespread interest in the entertainment industry. The creation of Allegra Coleman was supposed to showcase the power of media manipulation right in our faces and the blurred line between reality and fiction in the world of celebrity journalism. I will say that this is one pro that the internet brings now, right? Like we can't just make up stuff like this anymore in the media and get away with it because everybody can fact check things like this now. However, it's still a crazy story to me. And I think that this really could have been at the bottom of the iceberg. It's, it's scary to think about how much effect that something like this might have had. Andrew McDonald. So William Luther Pierce, this is Andrew McDonald under a pseudonym. And Andrew McDonald was a controversial figure deeply involved in extremist politics and the founder of the National Alliance. National Alliance being a notorious hate group in the United States. So to start off, I think I need to go over Pierce, then get into Andrew McDonald. And Pierce was like a supervillain who uses intelligence to propagate white supremacist ideologies. And he did this meanwhile gaining notoriety as the leading ideologue of America's neo-Nazi movement. Pierce's influence also extended beyond the organization's membership of 1,500 individuals. He was able to exploit media and technology, creating ventures like the White Power Music Business Resistant Records, a publishing film named the Vanguard Books, and even a monthly paper, this guy did it all, named the National Vanguard. One of his most infamous creations was the Turner Diaries. And this is where Andrew McDonald comes in because Pierce did not publish the book in his own name, but under the pseudonym of Andrew MacDonald. And this published book would serve as an inspiration for Tommy McVeigh, the Gulf War veteran executed for the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing, as it outlined the neo-Nazi guerrilla group's actions, including the bombing of the FBI headquarters. Despite being monitored by the FBI after all this happened, Pierce was never convicted of any crimes. He remained a reclusive figure, running his operations from a vast property in West Virginia. So yeah, Pierce has done even more things than this, but we're not focusing on that. We're focusing on Andrew McDonald, and that's what Andrew McDonald did. So let's leave Pierce here and go on to the next entry. Borat Sagdiev. So Sagdiev is a fictional character created and portrayed by the British comedian Sacha Baron Cohen. And Borat himself is a satirical journalist who first gained popularity through Baron Cohen's television series, Da Ali G Show. And then he went on to become the central figure in the mockumentary film, Borat Cultural Learnings of America for Make Benefit Glorious Nation of Kazakhstan. This was released in 2006. Borat was also known for his distinctive accent, outrageous behavior, and just often offensive and politically incorrect remarks. Borat wasn't doing this with like ill intent. It was more so to expose and mock the cultural stereotypes and prejudices. And the way this character would do this was by interacting with real people in unscripted conversations and situations. And he would do it in this method in order to capture like genuine reactions to his absurd and inappropriate antics. It worked. But with all who attempt to go down this path, they receive both critical acclaim and controversy where the blend of satire and social commentary, there are always going to be people who hate things like this. 
However, his film was successful and it led to the widespread recognition of Borat, and he became an iconic figure in popular culture. Nat Tate. So, <laughs> Nat Tate is a fictional character created as part of an elaborate art world hoax orchestrated by the author William Boyd. The hoax was revealed in Boyd's book, Nat Tate, an American Artist, 1928 through 1960, published in 1998. The book presented Nat Tate as a talented but troubled American abstract expressionist painter who tragically took his own life at the age of 32. Boyd's creation of Nat Tate included a fabricated biography, a collection of paintings attributed to Tate himself, and endorsements from notable figures in the art world. The goal of the hoax was to explore the nature of artistic fame and the gullibility of the art community. And the fact that he got away with this for 30 plus years, I guess his point was proven. Many in the art world believed the existence of Nat Tate and his tragic story. Nobody questioned it. Again, these are the most interesting and disturbing entries to me because it's in a way similar to a mass psychosis. However, I don't think it's that big of a deal, especially since pen names are so commonplace nowadays. Jacob Maria Mirshi. So Jacob Maria is a fictional character that was created as part of a long-running and elaborate political joke in German politics. Mirsheed is a fictitious member of the Bundestag, the German federal parliament, and the character was created in the 1970s as some sort of playful and humorous way to illustrate the sometimes complex and seemingly absurd processes of parliamentary decision making. However, nowadays you guys know if this happened in like America or Europe, the people would be furious. But let's focus on Jacob. The fictional biography of Jacob includes details such as his birth in Luxembourg, his academic background, his affiliation with the Social Democratic Party of Germany, all of this being made up. However, people tend to go along with it in Germany, I believe. They even bring up Jacob in jokes during debates and documents, adding a touch of humor to the sometimes serious and formal political proceedings of Germany. So I guess they have a good sense of humor over there. Maybe speaking. Mavis Beacon is a fictional character who serves as the mascot for a popular, long-standing series of educational software that's designed to make your typing skills better. Pretty sure you guys might have seen this lady before. The software is known as the titular Mavis Beacon Teaches Typing, and the software has gone through several versions and updates since its release in the 1980s, adapting to changes in technology and even adding new features to enhance the learning experience. While Mavis Beacon herself is fictional, she has had a lot of impact on the lives of old heads. She's been widely used in schools, businesses, homes, long time ago, but now I doubt you'll see her software anywhere. People just learn on their own nowadays. Pope Joan. Pope Joan is a figure from Western medieval folklore, and the story suggests that a woman disguised as a man served as a pope for a brief period of time in the Middle Ages. According to the legend, Pope Joan supposedly reigned as Pope during the 9th century, and the details of her story vary. However, the most common version claims that she concealed her gender, then rose through the ranks of the church hierarchy, and then her true identity was revealed when she gave birth during a procession. And I think a lot of people don't believe Pope Joan exists because there's just no evidence to support that she ever did and her story is widely considered to be a myth or historical fabrication. The legend did likely come from the 13th century and became even more popular during the Renaissance. While early chronicles include references to Pope Joan, historians generally just dismiss her. They don't believe anything, including her, is real. Bridie Murphy. So Bridie Murphy is a case of alleged past life regression and this gained attention during the 1950s. It all began with the work of Virginia Teague, who was an American housewife who under hypnosis in 1952, claimed to recall memories of a previous life as an Irish woman named Bridie Murphy. And during the hypnosis sessions, Virginia provided detailed information about Bridie's life in the 19th century Ireland, including her family, surroundings, and experiences. And this entire thing became widely publicized after the publication of the book, the Search for Bridie Murphy. This was written by, not Virginia, another person named Maury Bernstein in 1956. And the book just chronicled Bernstein's investigation into Virginia's claims and the purported memories of her past life as Bridie Murphy. And the main reason people don't believe Bridie Murphy ever existed was because 
when she would recount her memories of 19th century Ireland, there were just many historical inaccuracies and inconsistencies found in the description of her 19th century Ireland. So with that, that just kind of like debunked everything she was saying. A lot of the stuff she was saying just wasn't making sense. Ponsonby Brit. So Ponsonby was a fictional character credited as the executive producer of several iconic television shows such as Rocky and the Bullwinkle Show, Fractured Flickers, Hoppity Hooper, stuff like that. And the name was active during the 1950s and 60s. Ponsonby Brit was not a real person, never was, but was a creation by Jay Ward and Bill Scott, the minds behind all of those shows. In 1959, Warren and Scott playfully coined the name Ponsonby Brit Unlimited as the title for the new corporation. And the character of Ponsonby Brit was humorously portrayed as an officer of the Order of the British Empire. And they kept that title on Ponsonby Brit's name on the closing credits of the cartoons as an inside joke amongst the creators. According to Bill Scott, the decision to just create Ponsonby Brit was because they didn't have an executive producer, so they just wanted to have fun and make up somebody. That's it, really. They even went as far as giving Ponsonby Brit a fictional official biography, which was cleverly utilized in press releases, and the inclusion of this guy was just a fun joke for everybody included. Anthony Godby Johnson. Anthony Godby Johnson is a controversial and mysterious figure in the literary world this time. In the mid-1990s, there was a memoir named A Rock in a Hard Place, One Boy's Triumphant Story. This book was purportedly written by Anthony Godby Johnson, and the book detailed his alleged experiences of abuse, survival, and triumph over adversity. However, the authenticity of Anthony Johnson and his memoir came under scrutiny because people started questioning whether he really existed or not. And by proxy, the events of the book. Despite claims of surviving abuse and the life-threatening illnesses that were described in the book, there were just inconsistencies in the narrative and attempts to verify Johnson's existence proved challenging. Complicating matters even further than they already were, we already know that since Anthony Godby Johnson never existed, he was not available for public appearances. And the only way people were able to communicate with him were through letters. And from there on, it just got worse and worse and now we don't even think he ever existed. Earn Malley. Earn Malley is a literary hoax created in 1943 by Australian poets James McAuley and Harold Stewart. The two poets who were critical of the modernist poetry decided to construct a fictitious poet and create a body of work under the name Earn Malley to satirize what they perceived as the absurdity of contemporary poetry. The name Earn Malley was derived from the first two letters of the name of two locations in Sydney, the first being Erkinsville and the other being Malley Street. The poets composed a series of poems that deliberately included nonsensical phrases, cliches, and just a bunch of disjointed memory, a lot of nonsense. And the intent was to mock what Megali and Stewart considered to be the pretentious and overly obscure nature of modernist poetry. And I'm going to be honest, we need them now more than ever. If you've seen some of the poetry that's been coming out recently, it is nonsense. However, the poems were submitted to the literary magazine Angry Penguins under the name Earn Malley, and they were published posthumously. The editors of the magazine, unaware of the hoax and the scheme going on, of course went ahead and praised the work as just innovative and profound, kind of proving Stewart and McAuley's point here, and they revealed the deception in a subsequent issue, and once they did that, it just created a huge controversy in the Australian literary scene. And while people did not like these two for doing what they did at first, as time went on, it's become viewed as a clever and successful satire of the modernist literary movement. So yeah, they kind of proved their point in the end. Penelope Ash. Penelope Ash is a fictional character who was also a part of a literary hoax, but in the 1970s this time, and this character was at the center of the Naked King to Stranger scandal, a collaborative effort by a group of journalists to expose the supposed literary and publishing standards of the time. In 1969, Newsday columnist Mike McGrady was frustrated with what he perceived as the declining quality of popular fiction. And to kind of combat this, he enlisted 24 of his colleagues to create a deliberately trashy and just complete ass novel. The goal was to see if the poorly crafted book with explicit content and a salacious storyline could become a best-selling book with just the correct tools in marketing. And the result of all of this was the book, Naked Came to Stranger, previously mentioned before, 
and this was attributed to the fictional Penelope Ash. And Penelope Ash is the supposed author here, by the way, the fake author. The novel was intentionally filled with cliches, sex scenes, and predictable plot. And despite its lack of literary merit, the book became a commercial success, climbing the bestsellers list. Just like the previous entry, once they proved their point, they revealed the hoax in a follow-up article, and this was to kind of expose the literary establishment's focus on sensationalism rather than substance of a story like real writing. And the stunt demonstrated how marketing and publicity could make a book seem better than it actually is. And that was the whole point of that scandal. Tony Clifton. So Tony Clifton is an alter ego that's associated with the comedian Andy Kaufman. And Kaufman was known for his unconventional comedic style, which often blurred the lines between reality and performance. And Tony Clifton is one of Kaufman's most infamous creations. Tony Clifton was portrayed as quite boorish, offensive, and an intoxicated lounge singer with a brash and abrasive demeanor. Kaufman, along with his writing partner Bob, would sometimes don the persona of Tony Clifton, even going to great lengths to maintain the illusion that Clifton was a real person. This included hiring other performers to impersonate Clifton and insisting that Clifton and Kaufman were completely separate individuals and nobody really believed them. The character of Tony Clifton made appearances in many venues, comedy clubs, television shows, and even an opening act for some of Kaufman's performances. Tony Clifton's act was part of Kaufman's commitment to pushing the boundaries of traditional comedy and challenging the audience's expectations. And I'm pretty sure, I'm just going off of a guess here, he probably did this to separate himself from the quite potentially controversial personality of Tony Clifton. And I guess it worked. John Baptiste Botol. John Baptiste is a fictional character who was created by the French philosopher Frederic Pages. And this guy was introduced in a satirical article written by Frederic in 1998. And in this article, Frederic basically claimed that John Baptiste was a 19th century French philosopher new on the scene who had just developed this philosophy called Botolism. Botolism is not a real philosophy. It was instead intended to mock the world of academia and the philosophical community. Despite this, this mockery gained serious attention and was discussed by some individuals who were just unaware of the satire. Frederic later expanded on the fictional character by writing a book titled The Sex Life of Immanuel Kant, which attributed various anecdotes and fictional aspects to both Jean Baptiste Botol and historical figure Immanuel Kant. Nothing worth noting here about this character, however, just like the previous entries, it was here to make a point and it surely did. Ghost of Kiev. So the Ghost of Kiev is like a fictional airplane, which became a symbol of Ukrainian resilience during the Kiev offensive on February 24, 2022. This narrative emerged in the early hours of the invasion and what it did was claim that there is this mythical pilot that shot down six Russian planes, including SU-35s and SU-25s. And while the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense hinted at the Ghost of Kyiv possibly being a skilled reserve pilot, the story gained momentum with the former president Petro even sharing a false image claiming to be the legendary pilot. And despite the initial claims of the security service of Ukraine, the Ukrainian Air Force did eventually acknowledge the Ghost of Kyiv as a fictional character like the ghost itself and this revelation came about two months after this story was spread all over the internet. Although I am pretty sure that like, although the Ghost of Kiev character that we made on the internet is fictional itself, there was a pilot who is the person who was doing all these things that we hyped up, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, that's who the Ghost of Kiev is. Conchita Wurst. Conchita Wurst is the stage persona of Austrian singer and drag queen Thomas Newworth. And Conchita gained massive fame after winning the Eurovision Song Contest in 2014 with the song Rise Like a Phoenix. And combined this with the singer's androgynous appearance, it led to Conchita being quite known, especially since times were different back then. It challenged traditional gender norms and sparked discussions about identity and self-expression. And the message of acceptance and individuality resonated with many. And the victory at Eurovision, all of it just combined into making this big point. And after the Eurovision stage, Conchita continued to be an advocate for LGBTQ rights and a prominent figure in the entertainment industry. But of course, Conchita Worst does make this list because she's not a real person. Thomas Newworth is the real person, so makes her non-existent. Colonel Toom. 
Colonel Toome was a mythical figure who was associated with the North Vietnam Air Force during the Vietnam War. And the character itself was loosely based on a pilot named Nguyen Van Cock from the 921st Fighter Regiment. And according to the legend, Toome claimed to have shot down 13 American aircraft before allegedly being eliminated in action on May 10, 1972. However, historical investigations did eventually reveal that there was no such thing as a Colonel Toome in the North Vietnamese forces. The creation of the Colonel Toome narrative likely involved the use of a name similar in sound to Toome as a radio call sign in Vietnamese transmissions intercepted by the US radio signals intelligence. But we don't really know. John Doe. We know what John Doe is, guys. I don't think I need to explain this. Prester John. Prester John is a legendary mythical figure who is believed to be a Christian king and priest who ruled over a distant and fantastical Christian kingdom. The legend of Prester John gained popularity in medieval Europe and was fueled by a combination of myth, fantasy, and just <laughs> misinformation about distant lands. According to these tales, John's kingdom was said to be located somewhere in the east, often described as a land with just a lot of wealth, wisdom, and Christian piety. It was believed that he himself ruled over a utopian Christian realm that was isolated from the known world. The name Prester is thought to be a European corruption of the word Presbyter, let me know if I said that right. And this is supposed to emphasize his role as both the king and religious figure and the stories that were told about him. The legend of Prester John did capture the imagination of Europeans during the Middle Ages and various medieval texts, letters, and maps were referencing him and his kingdom. But as time went on and we, you know, started learning more and more and more about how the world works, we eventually came to the conclusion that his mythical kingdom never existed. So with that, we close out tier two, and now we are going to enter tier three. Let's get into it. Halifax Slasher. The Halifax Slasher was a fictional character who became the center of a mass panic and hysteria event in England. This was around the 20th century. And the events unfolded in 1938 when rumors began to go around about this mysterious figure who was allegedly, and I mean allegedly, attacking people with a razor or a knife in the streets of Halifax. The panic started with reports of people who were being slashed or attacked by this unknown person, and then the descriptions of the supposed attacker varied, adding to the confusion. The fear paranoia quickly spread, which led to a widespread belief that there was a dangerous serial killer on the loose. The authorities became involved, and there were a considerable amount of police resources dedicated to investigating these alleged attacks, but as this investigation progressed, it became evident that many of the reported incidents were just either unfounded, not real, or massively exaggerated. There was no concrete evidence of a Halifax slasher ever being found or existing, so people have come to conclude that this was all part of mass hysteria. PDQ Bach. So PDQ Bach is a fictional composer and was a comic persona of the American musician Peter Schnickel. And the purpose of this non-existent person was to basically explore the cliches and intricacies of classical music, kind of make a mockery of it. But it was all for the sake of comedy, so it wasn't like a true mockery or true disrespect. And some of the most well-known works attributed to this PDQ Bach was the Concerto for Horn and Hard Art and Unaccompanied Piccolo. In editor's note, I came back to look at this and I'm pretty sure it features like kitchen appliances as the music for Horn and Hard Art. Anyways, to continue this, PDQ Bach did become like a beloved part of musical satire, so everybody likes him, everybody accepts the funny nonsense comedy out of this guy. And Peter has actually even used PDQ Bach's music in certain concerts, so. Cosma Prukov. So Cosma is a fictional literary character in a collective pen name used by a group of Russian writers and poets in the mid-19th century. This pseudonym was created as a humorous and satirical outlet for the authors to lampoon various aspects of Russian society, literature, and bureaucracy all into one. The real identities of the writers behind Cosmo were the brothers Alex and Vladimir Korochkin and Alex's son, Alexei G. Korochkin. And together, they crafted witty and absurd verses, aphorisms, and satirical pieces under the guise of Cosmo. The works of Cosmo often featured clever wordplay, absurd logic, and the reflections on the absurdities of just contemporary Russian life. The writings were well received by the public though, 
and became popular in literary circles. The satirical nature of Cosmo's works just allowed authors to comment on the social and political issues indirectly of Russia, simultaneously using humor to convey these means so they could connect with others just easier and not cause a lot of trouble. Casey Nicole. Casey Nicole, whose real name was actually Debbie Swenson, was popular in the early 2000s as a blogger and internet personality. She presented herself as some kind of teenage girl who kind of like chronicled her battle with leukemia and shared her experience with a wide online audience. Her blog was called The Living Colors and it had like a big supportive community of followers who sympathized with her struggles. But in 2001, it was revealed that Casey Nicole and her entire online persona was all fabricated. Debbie Swenson, who was the person behind this character again, was not a teenager battling leukemia. This revelation shocked the entire online community and raised ethical questions about the creation of just fake online identities. Although, ironically, we have tons of these nowadays. Debbie Swenson's actions were referred to as a hoax or catfishing and kind of began this epidemic of hoaxes and catfishing that we see today. And her tale does kind of serve as a cautionary warning to those who see things online and just believe it. Tisa's Dugovix. So I'm just going to call this person Dugovix because I'm, I can't pronounce the first name, obviously. And Dugovix was a historical figure who was associated with the Siege of Belgrade in 1456. Dugovix is most well known for his heroic sacrifice during this battle. And the Siege of Belgrade was a critical event in the struggle between the Ottoman Empire and the Christian forces led by John Hunyadi. Dugovix was a Hungarian knight who fought in the defense of Belgrade against the Ottoman forces led by Mehmed II. And according to the historical accounts of these events, during the fighting, Dugovix noticed that the Ottoman flag was planted on the walls of Belgrade. So in an act of bravery and self-sacrifice, he climbed the walls, reached for the flag, and then tore it down. However, he paid the price for this act because he was killed by the Ottoman soldiers right after. Dugovic's sacrifice is just well known because it obviously celebrates heroism and valor in the Hungarian history, and he is often remembered for his bravery during the Siege of Belgrade. But I cannot find anything that necessarily points to him never existing, but he may just be doubted as a real person who existed because of how old these historical events were, so people probably don't know whether or not it was actually this person named Dugovix who went and did all these things that were just said. Carl Brandon. Carl Brandon was a fictional persona and a hoax fan created by a group of Bay Area fans, including Terry Carr, Ron Ellick, and a couple other guys. Initially conceived as just a pen name, Carl Brandon just eventually evolved into a full developed hoax because he was engaging in fan activities, producing fanzines, just actually being a real existing person under a different name. The elaborate ruse included placing Carl Brandon's name on the Fantasy Amateur Press Association waiting list and the hoax gained an unexpected twist when a conservative FAPA member raised a hypothetical question of how the association would respond if a black individual applied for membership. Mind you, this was back in like 1950s. In response, Carl revealed that he was black but hadn't deemed it important to mention earlier. The revelation had little impact on the FAPA or fandom, highlighting a more inclusive attitude. And guys, fandom is like, it was an association back then. So don't get it confused with the website. Carl's writing skills led to his early recognition as a big name fan. And many fans were disappointed when the truth emerged that he was never a real person in the first place. And how this came about was because one of the original creators of this personality signed a quote card that made its way to Ted White. And Ted White recognized Carl Brandon's signature and eventually just put the pieces together and exposed the elaborate hoax. Hajime Yatate. So Hajime is not an individual person, but a collective pseudonym used by the Sunrise Anime Studio for all the creative staff that are involved in the production of their various series. These series include Cowboy Bebop, Code Geass, Mobile Suit Gundam, all of those. So yeah, they give credit to Hajime Yatate because it's supposed to like respect and represent all of the creative staff again. George P. Burdell. So George P. Burdell is kind of like a running joke or a running gag of the Georgia Institute of Technology in the United States. 
And this character was created by Georgia Tech students in the 1920s and has just been a legendary figure associated with the college ever since. This story goes that George P. Burdell was enrolled at Georgia Tech in 1927, but he never attended any classes. Despite his absence, he had been listed on the class rolls and his name appeared in the Georgia Tech yearbook, campus directories, and even on the school's alumni rolls. Over the years, students have continued to include George P. Burdell in various campus activities, creating an amusing and just never-ending tradition of this guy. One of the most famous pranks involving George P. Burdell occurred in 1956 when students managed to get him on the roster for a flight training program at Georgia Tech. Reportedly, he received pilot training and even logged flight hours, all without setting foot inside of an aircraft. Helen Dale So Helen Dale is an author and political commentator who was known for her work in literature and political writing. For example, the hand that signed the paper is a historical novel that explores the political complexities of collaboration during the World War II. The novel, written when Dale was only 22 years old, sparked controversy and discussion about historical fiction, the nature of collaboration, and the responsibilities of writers because obviously she went into some heavy topics, let's just say. In addition to this work in literature, as I mentioned previously, she's been active in political commentary, contributing articles to various publications. She's written on a range of topics, laws, cultural issues, just tons of things. But she makes this list because... You know, she's one of the personalities that are known by a pen name and on the internet don't really have a true identity or a real name to her. Ahmet Boram Borad. So I'll just call this guy Borad, and he was an eccentric medical con artist who operated in the late 18th century Dublin. His assumed name was used by Patrick Joyce or possibly William Combs of Dublin to create a fictitious character, and Borad presented himself as a native Turk donning an unusual dress, turban, and exotic affectations. However, in 1769, he promoted the healing properties of bats in a pump house in Finglas, country Dublin. And this was focused on the local St. Patrick's Well. And despite claims of medical practices being used here and just having experience, there's never been any evidence of recognized medical qualifications. So Borodom Borad did gain support from Dublin medical professionals and lobbied parliament for funds to build this hot and cold seawater bath. But after an incident at a party for parliamentary members, support waned because rumors including one about Borad strangling Christians in Constantinople damaged his reputation. Later on, his true identity was revealed. He fell in love with and married the sister of William Hardigan. And at the time, this guy was well known in the medical world. And with this true identity being revealed in order to marry this woman, all the BS was called out. So the guy vanished from historical records after converting to Christianity and shaved his beard and he was never heard from again. Eddie Burrow. So this is the fake identity of Elizabeth Durack, who was a white Australian artist. And this stirred up big controversy by creating an extended series of paintings in an aboriginal style under the pseudonym of Eddie Burrow. When her deception was exposed, Dirac faced like really big criticism and she just refused to apologize for it. Instead, she chose to justify her actions by citing her extensive contact with Aboriginal people in their art, suggesting that her immersion in the culture justified her adoption of an Aboriginal artistic identity. The controversy surrounding Dirac's artistic project resonates with like all the post-colonial perspectives on the forgery of indigenous artworks and not only that, you know, with all the cultural appropriation stuff going on, people just aren't a big fan of it. To summarize all of this, Elizabeth's creation of Eddie Burrup and the subsequent reactions underscore the intricate connections between art, identity, and the post-colonial considerations of this, I guess, cultural appropriation conversation that's being had nowadays. And honestly... Uh, you know, if you, in my opinion, if you spent a lot of time in the culture, it is kind of bound to be a part of you at some point, and thus I think that it's okay to express her art in this manner. Walter Plinge. Walter Plinge is a fictional character who was often used as a pseudonym in the entertainment and theater industry. This name has been used in almost every single role of the entertainment industry, so it kind of reflects that anybody can use it just to remain anonymous. So it's just a name with multiple roles. It's not like a real person or a real name. 
That's all there really is to it. Phantom Heelbrin. So the Phantom of Heelbrin refers to an unidentified female serial criminal whose DNA was found at various crime scenes in both Germany and Russia. And this Phantom's criminal activities were initially linked to a series of murders, thefts, and other offenses spanning from 1993 to 2009. This mysterious criminal, due to her crazy streak of crime and just getting away with it, was given the moniker of the Phantom of Heelbrin. Or at least that's what we thought it was. Because in 2009, it was actually revealed that the DNA found at all these crime scenes belonged to a woman who was working in a factory that produced the cotton swabs used by the police for evidence collection. So this revelation led to the conclusion that the Phantom of Heelbrin was actually a contamination issue rather than one single super competent criminal. And that's kind of scary because it tells us that the person, like the people who got away with those crimes are never going to be caught or at least caught by having their DNA matched with the evidence on the scene. Yara Zimmerman. So Yara is actually a fictional character who was created by Czech comedians Yeri and Ladislav. And Yara was introduced in the 1960s and is supposed to be a versatile and eccentric figure who, according to the super elaborate backstory, was a polymath, inventor, and unrecognized genius. The character was initially introduced in a radio show and later expanded into various plays, books, and films. Yara's fictional biography claims that he was born in Vienna, Austria in 1859, but lived most of his life in the shadows, contributing to various fields without receiving due recognition. The creators designed the character as a satirical and humorous commentary on Czech culture, history, and just the idea of a national hero. Yara became quite popular in the Czech culture, and his legacy has obviously extended beyond the radio sketches. Like I said earlier, the guys in like books, movies, they, they like to play around with this dude. Pause. Spanish Prisoner. The Spanish Prisoner is a confidence trick with roots dating back to at least the early 19th century. As detailed by Eugene Francois, the scam involved a confident trickster convincing the victim that they are in contact with a wealthy individual of a high estate in prison in Spain under a false identity. The imprisoned person is often portrayed as some kind of like wealthy stranger or like a distant relative of the mark. To summarize this entry very quickly, it, it's basically the Nigerian prince scam, but with the setting of this scam being like, I'm a Spanish prisoner who's quite rich and I need your help and I will give you money if you help me. That's all that really is. Budo and Tiburo. I'm only going to say those names once, but both of those characters are commonly used in Cajun jokes and humor. B and T are just stereotypical Cajun names and represent a comedic duo often portrayed as friends or neighbors in various humorous anecdotes. The stories typically highlight their interactions, misunderstandings, witty exchanges, and just often play on the Louisiana Cajun dialect and culture. The humor involving Budoho and Tiburo often rely on like wordplay, cultural references, and the portrayal of their distinctive personalities, and they become iconic figures in Cajun humor. They're the kind of guys that you would see in like Facebook memes shared by your grandma and grandpa. Pretty sure you can see it on the screen. You get what I'm talking about here. Salvino di Amati. So Salvino is often credited with the invention of eyeglasses, although historical evidence is not really clear. And attributing the invention to a single individual is kind of challenging because it's been a long time since eyeglasses were created, right? And these things were created over 800 years ago. So Getting the historical records of that time to confirm this is just messy. It never works well. Never makes sense either, to be honest. The story goes that he crafted lenses mounted in frames made of wood or bone. And these early eyeglasses were primarily intended to aid individuals who had problems with seeing and mostly farsightedness rather than close sightedness. However, it's essential to note that the invention of eyeglasses themselves was likely a gradual development with various people over time just contributing to the refinement of the the structure of the eyeglasses over time making them better and better to what we have today while the details of salvino's contribution to the invention of eyeglasses remain somewhat uncertain he is often mentioned to be the inventor or the initiator of the creation of eyeglasses richard bachman richard bachman is a pseudonym used by american author stephen king and King had adopted the pseudonym in the late 1970s and early 1980s to publish several novels without the immediate association with his well-known name. 
And the reason for this was to test whether or not his success in being an author was due to true talent or luck. And under the Bachman name, Stephen King wrote several novels, including Rage. And I've read this book before. This one's actually kind of messed up and I'm pretty sure it's banned to this day. Let me know if otherwise. The Long Walk, Road Work, and The Running Man. The ruse was eventually uncovered and Richard Bachman's true identity as Stephen King became public knowledge. And despite the initial attempt for King to keep these two identities separate, the writing styles and the themes of the stories were similar enough for fans and critics to draw connections between the two. So obviously, there was talent in how he wrote because people recognized his writing style, you know, attributed him to Stephen King. And on a side note, fun fact, since this channel is at 4,000 subscribers almost, this channel was kind of made for me to test whether or not I knew what I was doing on YouTube or not to see how much I really know about it and to see if I could help others make YouTube channels in the future. I have another channel. Some of you guys may know me as 100. But yeah, this channel was literally an experiment. So it's kind of cool to see this on the list. Roger Dodsworth. Roger Dodsworth was the center of a huge hoax in 1826. And this originated from a French newspaper report that claimed that a man in his 30s had been discovered under ice in the Alps. The man claiming to be Roger Dodsworth was the son of an antiquarian born in 1629 and was supposedly buried in 1660 after being trapped under an avalanche and miraculously revived. The story obviously gained traction in London newspapers. You guys know how they ate stuff up like this back in the day. But various publications suggested remedies for Dodsworth's century-old stiffness, including bathing in milk, and satirical elements were also introduced with Thomas More's poem in the Times characterizing Dodsworth as a perfect Tory. Amidst the Dodsworth craze, Mary Shelley wrote a short story also titled Roger Dodsworth, and this was submitted to the new monthly magazine in September, and the tale presented Dodsworth returning to Switzerland to die. But this story actually has like a humorous twist to it if you want to look at it yourself. However, yeah, that's what Roger Dodsworth was, just like a very interesting, kind of funny hoax that eventually just got made into a big joke as time went on. David or Daywood Apfelbaum? I'm gonna call him Daywood. He was a fictional character in a hoax that was credited as the commander of the Jewish Military Union during the 1943 Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. He was initially attested in 1948 by Henrik Iwanski and later mentioned by other individuals who claimed to have fought an uprising under Apfelbaum's command. However, their statements were found to be false and historians have just overall discredited the existence of Apfelbaum. This hoax, David himself, gained traction in the 1950s and early 1960s. They portrayed Apfelbaum as a lieutenant in the Polish Armed Forces and the creator of the Jewish Military Union. Various accounts described his death on April 28th, 1943 during the uprising and the story spread by Iwanski and others was later published in Israel in 1962, contributing to its historical acceptance. However, again, he was exposed as a fabrication for personal gain of Iwanski and the people who created him. Dr. Irving Joshua Matrix. So Joshua Matrix, previously known as Joshua Bush, is a fictional polymath scientist, scholar, cowboy, and entrepreneur who is known for his extraordinary contributions to various fields, including perpetual motion engineering, biblical cryptography, and just tons of other niche stuff. It's, it's kind of laughable. He was created by the scientific American columnist Martin Gardner in 1960, and Dr. Matrix served as a satirical character to provide colorful context to mathematical puzzles and spoof pseudoscientific theories, and just offer like a funny humorous introduction to a lot of these serious super intelligent topics according to the dr matrix lore he was born in japan learned the secrets of the conjuring arts and worked as an assistant to the famous japanese magician tenkai he was a friend and student of nicholas borbaki and often faced persecution from establishment authorities despite numerous accusations of frauds and even reports of his death in a duel against a kgb agent Dr. Matrix was later revealed to be alive and well in Casablanca in 1987. Throughout the years, Martin Gardner, the creator of Dr. Matrix, chronicled the adventures of Dr. Matrix in various mathematical game columns where the character engaged in fanciful dialogues and just all types of other nonsense. So he, he's still around, although he doesn't really exist. Lonely Girl 15. Lonely Girl 15 was an early and influential example of a web series that utilized the vlog format 
kind of like the web series called the marble hornets if you guys heard about it but just way early like this series was out on youtube in 2006. the series initially presented itself as like an authentic video diary of a girl named brie and it was played by jessica lee rose and brie would like share her thoughts experiences and daily life with the audience the videos were presented in the typical vlog style and early episodes mainly focused on just her ordinary life and teenage life and concerns However, as the story progressed, it evolved into a complex narrative with, you know, character development, mysterious characters, organizations, crazy stuff. It really is like the originator of that. I won't say it's like the originator of the Marble Hornets kind of um, video web series format, but it did it way ahead of its time. And the revelation of the series being fictional caused a mix of reactions with people feeling deceived because they obviously thought that like, in the earlier seasons that Brie was like a normal person and she was a real person. They felt betrayed obviously and with the um, secret organizations going on. Just take a look at it if you're interested. I, I said enough here, I don't wanna spoil anything. Roderick James. Roderick James is a fictional character who serves as the credited film editor on several films directed by Joel and Ethan Cohen. He doesn't really exist, but I, you know, like previous entries, he serves as a pseudonym used by the Cohen brothers when editing their films themselves. Fun fact, Roderick James was actually nominated for Academy Awards for Best Film Editing, although, like I said earlier, it was the Cohen brothers. They still nominated Roderick James because nobody knows, right? Johan Wassman. Johan was a fictional creation of artist and writer Jeff Wassman and is often mistakenly perceived as a lesser known late 19th century European artist associated with Dada and surrealist movements. The character's vivid tale unfolds against the backdrop of Lay's Pig, Germany, where Wasman is born into a family of carpenters in around like 1841, I think. And the narrative kind of like weaves through Johann's life, including his roles such as a sewage engineer, university lecturer, and an art provocateur challenging traditional education. Wasman's legacy is expressed through his innovative box assemblage works. This was called the Dresden Boxes where Johan reflects upon his unease with the changing modern times. And to sum up Johan's existence, he allows Jeff to write stories where he can blur the lines between reality and fiction while serving a critical reflection on the art world, societal changes, and the transformative potential of the internet. Alan McMasters. So Alan McMasters was the fictitious inventor of the electric toaster. In the story behind Alan McMasters, was a real person named Alan McMasters and his friend decided to play a joke by adding false information about the toaster's inventor and over time the wikipedia's article grew more elaborate with invented details about McMaster's life and contributions including a connection to the London underground's lighting systems. The hoax survived for years appearing in books, articles, and even being considered for the Bank of England's $50 note. Which is crazy it, it came a long way but some teenager named Adam like exposed the whole thing and somehow found a fake photo on Wikipedia, proved it was fake, and Wikipedia just took it down and hid it from existence. So yeah, Ally McMasters is almost the greatest finesse in human history. Praxides. Praxides was a Christian saint who was recognized by the Roman Catholic Church in the Eastern Orthodox Church. But the details of her life were not really well documented in some aspects I'm about to go over, maybe fictitious or just really hyped up and, you know, legendary, quote unquote. According to tradition, Praxis was a Roman noble woman who lived in the second century. She and her sister, Saint Pudentiana, were said to have devoted themselves to helping persecuted Christians during the reign of Emperor Marcus Aurelius. They were known for their acts of charity, including burying the bodies of Christian martyrs. The most well-known legend associated with Praxis involves a pool of blood, and it is said that she and her sister collected the blood of martyrs and stored it in a well or a pool, uh, I don't know which one, in their home, thus providing a sacred burial place for those who had died for their faith. The historical accuracy of these details is quite uncertain and Praxides existing is uncertain as well, but she is honored as a symbol of Christian charity and devotion and they even have a feast day for her on July 21st in the Roman Catholic Church and July 19th in the Eastern Orthodox Church. So. Whether or not she was truly real, doesn't matter. She still impacted many lives. We last ended off at tier three, and now we're gonna start off part two at tier four. Starting off tier four, we have Piat Zak. 
So Piot is a made up character at the center of a prank that was pulled off by BBC producers Hans Keller and Susan Bradshaw. The main act of this hoax was a composition titled Mobile for Tape and Percussion and it was supposedly crafted by Zach and performed by fictional Claude Tessier and Anton Schmidt. This musical mischief took place on the BBC third program on June 5th and the accompanying backstory claimed that Zach was a Polish composer influenced by Stockhausen and John Cage. And they added all this extra information so they can deceive everybody easier. However, the critics weren't fooled by this prank. They delivered overwhelmingly negative reviews that quickly identified this work as more of a studio joke than serious work. Despite their attempts to present the piece positively, a BBC spokesperson eventually labeled it as an experiment and then they gave up on that and just said, you know what, it's a hoax. Then later on, they had a radio documentary, The Strange Case of Piot Zat. And this aired on August 13, 1961, and it only featured discussions among Keller, music critics, just talking about the things that I just went over. And then eventually, Piot Zat made a return, but as a reviewer in the Musical Times. This contribution, though, was written by Keller, the same person who created Piot Zat the first time. And it was supposed to discuss Karlheinz Stockhausen's Zeichler score. And the review published in 1962 suggested that Zach's mobile might have influenced Stockhausen, adding a touch of irony to the entire thing that Piot Zach did before. So yeah, to start off tier 4, we actually have a non-existent person with a lot of lore for once. Wanda Kulmetry. So Wanda Kulmetry's hopes revolves around a person named Leon Carmen, and this person published a novel titled My Own Sweet Time in 1994 under the pseudonym of Wanda Kulmetry. So that, you know, Wanda Kumatri is another pen name, and this work was presented as an autobiography that narrates the life of a young Australian Aboriginal woman. And Carmen portrayed himself as an aspiring literary artist who claimed that his writing only received acclaim when he was publishing under a fake identity, which is why he made Wanda Kumatri in the first place. Back to the novel. This novel did also win the Nita May Dobby Award in 1995 and secured a spot on the shortlist for the 1996 New South Wales Premier Award for Literature. So, maybe his theory was correct. Masaw Bugdov. So, Masaw Bugdov is a football player who was created as part of a hoax in 2009. And this imaginary talent supposedly hailed from Moldova and was brought up as this rising star with crazy skills. And he was catching the attention of all the football enthusiasts and media outlets. The, the LeBron James of football, basically. And this hoax really gained its momentum when Bugda was falsely claimed to have signed with a prominent football club. This had people discussing about his talent and potential impact on the sport when he makes his debut. And that, of course, led up to him being found out because he was everywhere at that point. Major William Martin. So this character was created by the British military intelligence as part of Operation Mince Meat during World War II. The objective of this person and his plan was to mislead German forces regarding the allied invasion plans. They even gave this dude an epithet of the man who never was. Now on to Operation Mincemeat and I'll talk about that. To execute this operation, a fake officer, which was Major Martin, was created to carry documents suggesting an imminent allied assault on Greece. So the plan involved placing this fake identity alongside fake documents on a cadaver that would then wash ashore on Spain. This would lead the Germans to believe that the Allied forces were gearing up for an invasion in a different location. And to make sure this worked, they made sure that the fake identity card, the personal letters, all just looked really good. They, they really made them look good. The true identity of the body used in the operation was shrouded in secrecy. However, they did reveal it in 1996 that it was this guy named Glendir Michael, and he was a homeless man from Wales. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention, the place that they actually invaded was Sicily, and it just all went through as they expected. Operation Mince Me actually worked out. Taro Sujimoto. Taro Sujimoto is a fictional character in a prank played by the Buffalo Sabres during the 1974 NHL Amateur Draft. So this prank had the Sabres selecting Sujimoto, and they claimed that he was like this standout, crazy good player from the Japanese League. However, Sujimoto never even existed. The name was created by Sabre general manager Punch Imlock as a humorous response as to what he perceived as just an annoying, time-consuming, and tedious draft process. So they kind of did this just to call it BS, and the NHL in response voided their pit. 
However, the League and the Sabres did play along with the prank and turned Taro Sujimoto into this famous footnote, you know, icon of NHL draft history. Pretty sure NHL people who watched the sport would know about this. So, yeah, I don't know why it's actually this low. Honorable J. Fortescue. Honorable was born in 1868. However, like everybody else on this list, he never existed. He was a fictional creation by San Diego pathologist Rawson Pickard. And this imaginary figure was supposed to be the founder of the International Board of Hygiene. And funnily enough, this group was conceived during the Prohibition era in the Tijuana Bar. And despite its weird ass origins, the League of Nations officially recognized this board in 1926. Rawson Pickard, acting on behalf of Fortescue, wrote letters, authored articles, and fielded inquiries from journalists, and the board centered on hygiene, gained attention without facing much scrutiny. Its activities, including scientific presentations, expanding memberships, all that kind of stuff, continued until Pickard's death in 1963. And the elaborate ruse of Honorable J. Fortescue came to an end once Pickard passed. Because again, Pickard was the person who made Honorable J. Fortescue and used that identity. Lily of Virginia Mount Weasel. So Mount Weasel was made in the 1975 edition of New Columbia Encyclopedia. And her story goes like... Her being born in 1942 in Ohio and then you know she grew up with her own life and whatever and as of 1975 in that magazine when she was made and published in she was described as a fountain designer photographer but again she was just there to trick people into believing she was a real person but her true use as a non-existent person was to be used as a copyright trap and this was to catch like potential copyright infringements and this ingenious technique helped publishers identify unauthorized reproductions if the fictional entry appears in other works. So yeah, she's one of those non-existent people who serve to safeguard intellectual properties. George Paul Thoman. George Paul Thoman is a creation of the art group called Monochrome, and he was made in 2000 with a whole life story and all that, so I'll go over that real quick. He was born in Vorarlberg in 1945, and then became like this fictional member of the group Monochrome. And then in 2002, he really started to stand out because Monochrome used Thoman to navigate and kind of deal with political issues and represent Austria using artistic resistance. And George wasn't a real person, but Monochrome would use him to kind of speak about things that they wanted to speak about, but wasn't a good idea for them because, you know, they're real people. And then... In 2005, Monochrome eventually staged Thoman's death because I guess they just got tired of using him. And they announced that he had a tragic accident at the age of 60. And unaware of the hoax, Austrian newspapers printed Thoman's obituary. And a group even organized a funeral for him, complete with a tombstone. And it even featured an engraved URL linking the Thoman project page. But eventually it was found out that all of it was a hoax. People took down the tombstone without consent and threw it into a fruit cellar where he was eventually found. And yeah, that's pretty much the story of George P. Thoman. Hugo N. Fry. Hugo N. Fry was created by Cornell University students in 1930, and he was used as a prank to mock New York State politicians during the annual Cornell Daily Sun staff banquet. This plan concocted by Edward T. Horn III and Lester Blumner, the fabricated character served as a humorous focal point. The duo, inspired by a professor's skepticism about such pranks in the U.S., invited prominent Republican politicians to a banquet in honor of Hugo and Fry, and none of them fell for the prank, but they still went along with it by writing responses to the invitations about Hugo and Fry and praising him and just making him sound like this good guy that's done a bunch of things. Later on, Hugo and Fry resurfaced as a pseudonym used by John Patrick, an author and political satirist, and Patrick ran for public office 13 times over 23 years, adopting the name Hugo and Fry for his satirical political ventures. And people found out about this one because the New York Times reported it, and even Vice President Charles Curtis, one of the intended victims, took the joke in good spirits. Eventually, they left the name and the joke behind, and Horn became a pastor. Blumner serves as a U.S. Army Corporal in North Africa. Kilgore Trout. So Kilgore was created by renowned American author Kurt Vonnegut, and he first appeared in Vonnegut's novel, God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater, and Kilgore becomes a recurring character in several of the author's works. 
Trout is usually portrayed as a struggling and relatively unknown science fiction writer whose bizarre and imaginative stories often serve as a satirical commentary on just different parts of society, you know, relationships, work, everything. One of the notable features of Kilgore is that despite his origin, he has taken on a life of his own outside of Vonnegut's works. Other authors inspired by Kurt have incorporated Trout into their own works. And this is probably why he has a spot on this list because he's he's more than just Vonnegut's works. He's inspired many other authors and he's actually pretty well known despite being in one of the more obscure tiers on this list. Rene Kohler. So Rene was invented by William Barrington Coop and his role was to be part of a fraud in which he presented plagiarized recordings of classical pianists as the work of his wife, Joyce Hato. And Barrington Coop provided a false biography of Kohler, alleging that he was born in 1926, survived the Warsaw Ghetto and Treblinka concentration camp, and was a Soviet prisoner from 1945 to 1970 after a crushing hand injury in 1940. After the Joyce Hato affair, Kohler was falsely credited as the conductor in recordings featuring Hato, and later exposed as manipulated works of other artists, and there's really no evidence supporting Kohler's existence in the fabricated biography does resemble the true story of a conductor who is named Stanislaw Skrozuski. Franz Bibfeld. Franz is a parody of a scholar and a theologian, and the character was invented by Martin Gardner and first introduced in the pages of the magazine Scientific American in the 1960s. Bibfeld was presented as one of those elusive figures that you can never really get in contact with. I mean, he had a supposed body of work that included non-existent books, articles, and even a doctoral dissertation. I'm pretty sure that this satire was supposed to play on the conventions of an academic scholarship and the challenges of verifying references, you know, that can never really be found. Gardner's use of Franz is supposed to highlight the potential pitfalls and humors while you're in school and offers like a lighthearted commentary on the nature of intellectual authority and citation. Amina Abdallah Araf al Omari. Omari was created by Tom McMaster, a MA student at the University of Edinburgh in 2010. And McMaster created this persona of Amina, who was a Syrian woman and blogged as her during the early stages of the Arab Spring in Syria. Amina gained a lot of press attention and McMaster even formed a relationship with someone while posing as Amina. As suspicions arose about the authenticity of Amina, McMaster took the deception to an entirely new level, doing this by putting out this fake story that Amina had been kidnapped by the Syrian intelligence agency. And I believe the agency that was blamed for this was Mukha Barat, and this triggered international calls for a release. Various individuals eventually just gathered evidence and exposed Amina as a complete hoax and McMaster's actions were criticized for obvious reasons, including the appropriation of a privileged white man as an Arab woman and diverting international attention from real atrocities against Syrian activists. After the revelation, it was discovered that McMaster's, who now goes by Thomas J. McMaster, returned to the University of Edinburgh to pursue a PhD, despite promises to condemn his actions, and he has also been involved in teaching and academic roles. So yeah, you kind of got away with all that. Um, very interesting story though. Little Moon Moon. So Little Moon Moon was the supposed main character of this post titled, I thank this obnoxious friend for bringing me such a dismal national day on the Tiania form. I believe Tiania form is like this very old internet posting form. It's one of those very old school ones that was made like at the beginning of time. The post was created by somebody named Wrong Wrong, and these posts would depict a bizarre story of Little Moon Moon's antics during the National Day holiday, just full of humor and absurdity. And Little Moon Moon was described as this fat, crazy, obnoxious person, and their outlandish behavior would just catch the attention of this online community. The series of live updates would detail her visit to the Shanghai Expo with Wrong Wrong as her host. Um, there were stories including peculiar incidents like a uh, fake self-elimination farce or singing weird poetry. The narrative just overall garnered a bunch of popularity, accumulating over 17 million views and 57,000 comments within two days. Initially perceived as real, 
people have just began to put together that Little Moo Moo was fake and this led into a big internet investigation that revealed that Little Moo Moo was a persona by the writer Chu Jiayi and this was all to just kind of boost the popularity of Tianya at the time. Robbie Emmanuel Rabinovic. So for this entry, it goes over this document that contains a person named Robbie and he takes center stage in this speech that presents a vision of global domination that includes world wars, the eradication of religion, and the notion of controlling human mating to achieve world dominance. And this document incorporates references to a fabricated document called the Protocols of Zion. Um, Rabinovic's story does also include predictions of a Pax Judaica era lasting 10,000 years, complete with statements about manipulating technologies, suppressing religions, and orchestrating global conflicts. However, he's on this list because he doesn't exist and by proxy, this speech doesn't exist, but there's just this whole made up document about it if you wanted to check that out. George Spelvin. So George Spelvin is another one of those entries who's not an individual, but a theatrical tradition who's supposed to represent an anonymous and generic character this time around. So he represents really any uncredited or unseen character that's within the storyline. The use of George Spelvin does allow for flexibility in casting and plot developments, so when a character needs to remain unidentified or a surprise element is crucial, that's when we use George Spelvin because he provides a seamless way to preserve the mystery without revealing the true identity of a character. Cedric Allingham So Cedric was created by British author George Adamski in his 1953 book Flying Saucers Have Landed, and in this book, Allingham claims to have had contact with extraterrestrial beings during a visit to the planet Venus. And the narrative presents a detailed account of his alleged encounter with a humanoid Venusan named Orthon and the insights he gained about advanced civilizations beyond Earth. And yeah, that's all he really served to do, nothing more than that, nothing crazy. Henrik Batuta So Henrik was a fictitious character at the center of a hoax article on the Polish Wikipedia that lasted from November 2004 to February 2006. And this story presented a non-existent socialist revolutionary named Henrik, who was purportedly born as Isaac Affelbaum in Odessa, Ukraine, 1898. The biography claimed his involvement in the Russian Civil War, affiliation with the Communist Party of Poland, and just various activities and in international conflicts. The 10-sentence article gained attention after being exposed as a hoax, leading to its deletion on February 5, 2006. The perpetrator self-identified as the Batuta Army, aimed to highlight the existence of streets in Poland named after former communist officials. There was a claim of a Warsaw street named Henrik Batuta Street, but this was debunked as it was revealed that the actual street Batuti Street derived its name from the Polish word Batuta, meaning conductor's baton, and had no association with anybody. Despite efforts to maintain this ruse, including the upload of a doctored photograph, the hoax was exposed in articles by Polish publications and it underscored the need for vigilance and verifying information and highlighted the intersection of online content with real-world implications. Kriaku Tunoy Kriaku Tunoy was a fictional character claiming to be a Russian inventor in the early 18th century, boasting about creating the hot air balloon before the Montgolfier brothers. And the story originated from a questionable fragment in a chronicle, brought to attention by collector and forger Alexander Ivanovic in the 1820s or 1830s. According to the fabricated account, in 1731, a guy named Kriaku Tanoi from Nerekta crafted a balloon-like object and filled it with nasty smoke, looped around, and took off. The tale suggested that he collided with a bell tower after being lifted by the devil, surviving by holding on to a bell rope. Supposedly facing execution, Kriaku Tanoi was exiled to Solovetsky Monastery, promising to never fly again. Initially viewed as an early hot air balloon story, Dmitry Lyakchov exposed the manuscript as a forgery in 1958. Changes made between 1831 and 1901, including altering words and names, raised doubts about the entire narrative. Although this was debunked, it's still like a legendary story for aeronautics and people who are interested in that area, so it'll be brought up from time to time. Leopold Frankenberger. This entry is kind of hard to articulate, so I'll do my best to explain it. So there's a conspiracy that Hitler was Jewish, and to explain this, Hans Frank, who was a Nazi official, suggested that Adolf's grandmother had been employed as a housekeeper by a Jewish family, 
and Graz. And that family's 19 year old son, Leopold Frankenberger, had fathered Alois, basically insinuating that they did the deed and birthed Adolf's father, Alois. However, there is no record of Leopold's existence, and thus, everybody believes that this was all made up. S. Morgenstern S. Morgenstern is a fictional author created by William Goldman in his novel, The Princess Bride. In the book, Goldman presents The Princess Bride as an abridged version of the classic story by S. Morgenstern, which he claims his father used to read him as a child. Goldman, however, admits that he's providing a good parts version of the Morgenstern's work, skipping over the political and historical details that made the original book just long, boring, and tedious. In reality, S. Morgenstern is entirely a creation of William Goldman's imagination, and there is no original, unabridged version of The Princess Bride by Morgenstern. I do think that this entire fictional backstory is to kind of sell the book better, because it is making it seem as if Goldman had taken an already good story and just improved upon it when that was never really the case. Robert Edwards Robert Edwards was a Welsh buccaneer from around 1780 and is a part of a disputed legend. Descendants claim that Queen Anne rewarded him with 77 acres of Manhattan for disrupting Spanish sea lines. The story goes that he leased the land to the Kruger brothers for 99 years, intending to revert it to his heirs in 1877. However, no distribution occurred, and the land allegedly ended up with the Trinity Church. Trinity Church's records contradict this, saying that they acquired the land directly from Queen Anne in 1705, and despite this, the Edwards family persisted in their claims, with some asserting ownership of a fortune estimated at around $650 billion. In 1994, the Pennsylvania Association of Edwards Hares claimed profits from Edwards' lease held in a Chase Manhattan bank account but the bank denied any such account. High profile claims, multimedia productions, including a 1998 UK TV show called Find a Fortune revolved around this story. Investigations and legal proceedings, such as the 1999 embezzlement case in Pittsburgh, failed to produce conclusive evidence. The statute of limitations in New York, along with suspicions that the 99 year lease may have been a practical joke forged in 1880, has largely buried this claim. According to some accounts, E.F. Williamson, a known hoaxer, may have just fabricated the lease as a practical joke in 1880 as well. As you can see, there's just tons and tons of history around this guy, but a lot of people have come to conclude that he and his lease did not really exist. Bernard Weish Bernard Weish, also known as Bernard Weiss, appeared in the early 1980s as a linguist who supported theories about the differences between the Valencian and Catalan languages. Claiming to be a specialist at the University of Munich, Dr. Weiss remained quite mysterious. You know, he was one of those guys that was there but was refusing every interview and never seen on camera. And the university also denied employing anybody by that name, which made even more people doubt his existence. Conflicting reports about his attendance at the first Congress of the Valencian language in 1985 even further fueled the skepticism. Eventually, the Blavaris who created him had to admit the truth. The manuscripts he claimed to discover remained unpublished. Silence Do Good Silence Do Good was a pen name used by Benjamin Franklin himself to write a series of humorous and satirical letters to the New England Current, a newspaper that was founded by his brother, James Franklin. Franklin assumed the persona of a fictional widow named Silence Do Good to submit letters containing witty and clever commentary on whatever was going on at the time, mostly like the political and social issues. In between 1722 and 1723, Silence Duguid contributed a total of 14 letters to the current, each signed with a pseudonym. Franklin's intention was to lampoon certain aspects of Boston society, and his clever and humorous writing style was able to still gain attention from readers. However, once his brother realized that the letters were written by Benjamin himself, their relationship became strained. Pravo Jazdy Pravo Jazdy was initially perceived as a prolific and elusive traffic offender in Ireland, wanted across multiple countries for numerous speeding tickets and parking fines, and law enforcement struggled to apprehend him as he just consistently provided different addresses during encounters with authorities. However, the true revelation emerged when it was discovered that Jazdy was not an individual, but in fact, the Polish term for driving license. And this funny misunderstanding between the languages 
led to the creation of more than 50 fictional identities within the law enforcement system. The incident prompted a letter from a traffic division officer in June 2007, and he was obviously forced to urge a correction to all of these mistakes and try and bring out like relevant guidelines to prevent this from ever happening again. Pierre Brassel. So Pierre was apparently this avant-garde artist who had like a big resume and was kind of famous, but it was eventually revealed that he was truly a chimpanzee named Peter from Bora Zoo in Sweden. In 1964, journalist Aki Axelson orchestrated a hoax by displaying paintings created by Peter and attributing to this person named Pierre Brassau. The paintings were exhibited at Gallery Christne in Gothenburg, Sweden, where critics, despite some skepticism, ended up praising the works. And the hoax was later exposed but one critic still insisted that Peter's paintings were the best in the exhibition. One of the artworks was sold to a private collector for $90, and after this revelation, Peter was transferred to the Chester Zoo in England in 1969. It's kind of scary that art can't work like that sometimes. Like People can be so abstract or so bad at it that people think it's good. And it's not only because of that, but art is subjective, right? Beauty is subjective. It's it's funny that things like this can happen, and I think even in today's age, we would be more prone to it than ever. Josiah S. Carberry Josiah S. Carberry was created as part of an ongoing hoax by Brown University, and the university claims that Carberry is a professor of psychoceramics, which is the study of cracked pots. Carberry is often listed in the university's catalog with fake course offerings and descriptions, Despite him not really existing, Josiah S. Carberry is still a part of the, you know, Brown University lore and whatever kind of jokes they got going on out there. Martin Eisenstadt. Martin Eisenstadt was a pseudonymous invention created during the 2008 United States presidential election. And this character was presented as a senior fellow at the Harding Institute for Freedom and Democracy and he'd provide political commentary and analysis. However, it was later revealed to be a hoax, and of course he did not exist per this list. The hoax gained attention when it was disclosed that Martin Eisenstadt was a creation of filmmakers Ethan Gorlin and Dan Mervish. They used the character to satirize aspects of the media and political landscape during that election season, and that's really what his only purpose was. With that, we clear out tier four and let's get into tier five ronald opus so ronald opus is kind of an urban legend and it's a fictional narrative that involves a series of just funny yet ironic events although it's not really funny so on march 23rd 1994 there was a man named ronald opus and he attempted to self-eliminate himself by jumping off of a 10-story building however his life took an unexpected turn when as he passed through the ninth floor he was struck by a shotgun blast from an elderly man who was threatening his wife in the room above. So the guy with the shotgun was like pretty pissed during a marital dispute and he aimed a shotgun at his wife but he missed, unintentionally hitting Ronald Opus. And the couple claimed that they were unaware that the gun was loaded as the husband had a habit of brandishing an unloaded shotgun during arguments. Strange habit. So further investigation revealed that their son Ronald Opus himself had loaded the shotgun weeks earlier with the intention of having his father shoot his mother. So the big twist of this entire story is that Ronald was disappointed by the failure of his plan to have his mother murdered by his father, so he chose to end his own life by jumping off the building. William Ashbless So William was created by fantasy writers James Blaylock and Tim Powers during their student days at California State University. William began as a fictional poet and this was because he was supposed to be a response to the kind of horrible poetry that was featured in the school's magazine. One of those entries where the non-existent character is supposed to make a point about something that the creator of this character doesn't like. So they crafted nonsensical free verse poems and they submitted them under Ash Bless's name. And like with all stories before, the college paper ended up publishing these horrible verses. William did evolve beyond a simple prank in college though, taking on the persona of a 19th century poet and powers the Anubis Gates that was made in 1983. 
and he even made a cameo in Blaylock's The Digging Leviathan in 1984. What's funny is, both of the guys that made William and put them in their own books were unaware of each other's cameos of William in each other's books. They only found out that they both used William in their own books after an editor pointed it out for them. Beyond the novels, William persisted as a literary phantom, featuring in fictional works produced by Powers and Blaylock, including a non-existent poetry collection, Perspectives, in 1985, followed by On Pirates in 2001, and just a whole ton of other media. Cody Kennings Cody Kennings is part of a hoax that was unfolded in the Daily Egyptian, which was a student newspaper for Southern Illinois University. In this story, Cody's portrayed as an eight-year-old girl claiming to be the daughter of a U.S. Army soldier named Dan Kennings, who was stationed in post-invasion Iraq. So this whole thing unfolds through letters that was published in the student newspaper that details Cody's supposed experiences and words about her father's military service. And the hoax even involved the use of real individuals, including Caitlin Hadley, who played the role of Cody for photographs, a nurse named Patrick Trevilian, portraying the character of Dan, and the elaborate deception included staged photographs, unedited letters, they, they had the whole thing going on. But this entire thing was exposed when Reynolds claimed in 2005 of August that Cody died in Iraq. And, you know, it's an eight-year-old girl, that's kind of nuts. So the reporters from the Chicago Tribune became suspicious and saw an interview with Reynolds, which led to the unraveling of the entire fake story. A lot of people were upset with this, but like there are no charges or anything like that, although it is kind of a messed up thing to do. David Manning David Manning is a fictional film critic who was created as part of a marketing hoax in the early 2000s. And this character was created by Sony Pictures to provide positive quotes for their films and promotional material. Manning was presented as a critic for a newspaper that never existed like him himself, the Ridgefield Press. And his glowing reviews were featured in advertising campaigns for tons of Sony movies. The made up quotes praised the films like, like it was almost glazing them, portraying them as must see hits. But this was exposed in 2001 when Newsweek and the New York Times published articles revealing that David Manning's and his reviews were entirely fabricated. And with that being revealed, Sony Pictures had to go ahead and publicly apologize for what they did with David Manning, right? Because it's, it's obviously like, false advertising not really false advertising but they're they're deceiving tons of people and the incident raised ethical concerns about things like this right and if it's kind of why people do question whether these critics are really real or if they're paid off this is where it all began because of sony and their made-up critics praising all their movies that were probably horrible cw blubberhouse C.W. Blubberhouse was created by R.B. Russell and Mark Valentine, and this is a fictional poet and author introduced in 1993 through a privately circulated brief biography of Blubberhouse. That's the title of the book. And the character gained notoriety as letters attributed to C.W. Blubberhouse started appearing in various UK national newspapers and magazines, such as The Independent, Daily Mail, The Stage, Time Out, etc. And Blubberhouse even found a place in an Oxford College yearbook and a literary guide. So bro was everywhere. The hoax did come to light in 1994 when the Sunday Times criticized the Times Literary Supplement for publishing a letter from Blubberhouse and sent a reporter to investigate the correspondent. So somebody just wanted to kill the fun and of course with the investigation led to declarations that C.W. Blubberhouse was a hoax. At the funeral of Oxford bookseller Rupert Cook in 1999, that was when it was disclosed that Cook, alongside Roger Dobson, had played a role in crafting all of these Blubber House letters and stories and whatever. The story was later shared by R.B. Russell on John Peel's Home Truth program on Radio 4 2001, and I think that's when it was like publicly shared to everybody rather than just privately disclosed. Van Dam Budemeyer. So Van Dam Budemeyer is a fictional composer created by Kyrgyzstov Kieslowski for his film Decalogue 1 in 1988, and in the film, Budemeyer is portrayed as this renowned and super important composer whose compositions play a big role in the narrative. However, he's not really a real historical figure, but one of those made up historical figures that is supposed to be used for a movie. But if I had to guess based on just skimming over the movie and how it went, 
I think it was supposed to be used to explore themes of morality, fate, and the interconnectedness of lives within the context of the Ten Commandments. So to summarize, I believe that Budemeyer really is supposed to serve as a symbol of artistic influence and the power of music to invoke complex emotions and thoughts in the context of more dilemmas, you know, things going on in the world as presented in the movie of Degalogue 1. Andre Kasango Ilunga Andre was supposedly appointed as the vice president of the UNAFEC party and designated as the Minister for Foreign Trade in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in 2007. However, since, you know, it's a fake politician, you know, somebody with power, people begin to doubt that he ever existed despite being nominated by Prime Minister Antoine Gizenga. Kasango Ilunga failed to make an appearance during the inauguration of the new government and never assumed the responsibilities of his office. The local media and international community eventually came to consider Kasango as likely a non-existent person, believed to have been invented by Kisimba Ngoi, who is the leader of the UNAFEC party, possibly with the intention of securing the lucrative position for himself. But let's focus on Kasango and the whole controversy surrounding him finally unfolded within the political process that required political parties to submit short list of at least two candidates for ministerial roles with the prime minister making the final selection. In this case, the only two candidates presented for the foreign trade position were Kasago Ilunga and Kisimba Ngoi, who compiled the list himself. Gizenga, having opposed Motubu Seseko, a figure that Kisimba supported, opted for the unknown Ilunga. Kisimba later claimed that Ilunga had declined the role for personal reasons and had submitted a resignation letter, which Gizenga refused to accept unless Ilunga resigned in person. The incident did damage the entire government's reputation, leading to Kasimba's removal from UNAFEC in the urgent election of a new party president. And Kasimba got penalized and punished for trying to expose Ilunga because I do think that, now somebody come in the comments and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that like a lot of Africa's politics are kind of corrupt. I hear about it all the time. So he was trying to out that and he got kicked off the government and lost his job due to this. Let me know if I'm wrong though, but I think that's why he got punished for trying to expose this rather than the guy who made up the identity. Clay Bertrand Clay Bertrand, whose real name is Clay Shaw, was a New Orleans businessman and quite an important figure during like the John F. Kennedy assassination investigations. Shaw was the founder of the International Trademark in New Orleans and had various connections within the city's political and social circles. In 1967, New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison accused Shaw of being involved in a conspiracy to assassinate President Kennedy. According to Garrison, Shaw had used the alias Clay Bertrand and was implicated in a plot with Lee Harvey Oswald and David Fury. The trial against Shaw began in 1969 but ended with his acquittal in 1971. And despite the legal outcome, Shaw's involvement remains a subject of controversy and conspiracy theories related to the Kennedy assassination. And then there's also his portrayal in the Oliver Stone film JFK, which further fueled public speculation about the events surrounding Kennedy's death and his supposed involvement in them. Merit Pata. Merit was believed to be the first woman known by name in the field of medicine. She practiced medicine in ancient Egypt around 2700 BCE. And Mayor Patah was honored with the title Chief Physician, and her achievements were recognized in an inscription on her tomb. While there is really not that much information about Mary, her significance does still lie within being a pioneering figure in the history of medicine, particularly as one of the first female physicians. And the inscription on her tomb is a testament to her skill and the respect that she's earned in her lifetime. I just talk about Mayor Patah here because she's an entry on this list, however, I the link that the original creator of this iceberg provided doesn't really have any evidence as to how she's a non-existent person. So, you know, I'm just going to talk about her and still not skip her. Eustace B. Nifkin. Eustace B. Nifkin is one of those fictional students, but at the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry since the 1940s. And, you know, he's fake and all, but his name still appears on official college documents, class rosters, etc. The student lounge in Marshall Hall is known as Nifkin Lounge in his honor. He even received a fake diploma in 1972. 
and bro still has an ongoing presence on campus with emails sent from worldwide locations from him. He's been featured in various articles, including the Syracuse University Daily Orange and a Knothole, which is the ESF student newsletter. And though there is no known portrait of Snifkin, they do have him in the yearbook by showing like glimpses of his back as if he were a mysterious anime character or something. H. Rochester Sneath. So Rochester is a fictional headmaster of this made up school, Selhurst, and he was created by Humphrey Berkeley in a series of hoax letters dating from 1948. Berkeley, then a student at Pembroke College in Cambridge, invented sell her school and Sneath at the same time using printed letterhead and a forwarding address trick with the Royal Mail. So Sneath's whole story places him as the headmaster of sell her school near Petworth, Sussex, with 175 male students. Berkeley's hoax letters targeted various British public school headmasters and public figures, weaving absurd requests and inquiries. Notable recipients included the master of Marlborough College, and the headmasters of Stowe School, Undo School, and even the headmaster of Eton. Public figures like George Bernard Shaw, Sir Gillies Gilbert Scott, and Sir Adrian Bolt also received invitations to whatever Sneath wanted them to do. This hoax was exposed when Sneath's letter was published in the Daily Worker of 1948, and it was followed by an investigation by the News Review. The truth was revealed, leading to Berkeley's exclusion from the university for two years, and Sneath's letters were later published in 1974 under the title The Life and Death of Rochester Sneath. And this was also accompanied by drawings by Nicholas Bentley. Humphrey Berkeley went on to become a conservative member of parliament after this entire incident. John Rainwater. John Rainwater was a made up mathematician and he was created as a student prank at the University of Washington in 1952. Graduate students invented Rainwater and enrolled him in a mathematics course using a duplicate student registration form. Papers were later published under the pseudonym John Rainwater, and this focused on functional analysis, but not spaces and convex functions. Rainwater's theorem, an important result in summability theory and functional analysis, gained recognition. Despite him never existing, he is one of these non-existent people that actually have made a huge impact. The University of Washington Seminar on Functional Analysis is now named the Rainwater Seminar, and the associated rainwater notes have influenced Monarch Space Theory and Convex Analysis. Mathematicians including John Arc Isbell, Robert R. Phelps, Irving Glicksberg, and Edgar Asplund have published papers under the name Rainwater, acknowledging his fictional contributions. The concept of a pseudonym contributing valuable mathematics it is reminiscent of other instances such as Nicholas Burbaki in French mathematics. So John Rainwater is not even the first made up person to ever do this. Edna Welthorpe. Edna was used as a pseudonym by Joe Orton, who was a British playwright to write letters of complaint and criticism to various organizations and newspapers during the 1960s. Orton, along with his partner Kenneth Hallowell, used the persona of Edna to satirize societal norms and institutions. The letters were often supposed to be funny, yet provocative, just challenging the conventional attitudes of the time. And that's really it for Edna. Lucy Lightfoot. Lucy Lightfoot is a fictional story created by James Evans, and it revolves around this girl named Lucy who supposedly disappeared mysteriously from the Isle of Wight in 1831. And when she disappeared, it was during a near total eclipse of the sun in a violent thunderstorm. Her horse was found tied to the gate of St. Olive's Church in Gatcombe after the storm, but she was never found herself. Despite her parents offering a substantial reward for her return, a two year search yielded no results and they eventually moved away. And a detail in this legend that gets people like really interested in it is the discovery of a shattered steel misericord attached to a wooden effigy identified as Edward Esther in the St. Olive's Church. The effigy supposedly held a valuable crescent barrel set in lodestone on the hill, which was said to be found missing after Lucy disappeared. The story gained tractions with explanations involving a possible time slip and all kind of funky conspiracy theories behind her disappearance. Martin Smith. Martin Smid was a fictional Czechoslovak university student and he was supposedly eliminated 
in the police attack during November 17, 1989 student demonstration in Prague that marked the beginning of the Velvet Revolution. This false story originated from a porter at the student dormitory who spread the rumor, and Charter 77 activist Peter Earle believed the account and shared it with international media outlets, contributing to the fall of the Czechoslovak Socialist Republic. The alleged Martin Smith studied at the Faculty of Mathematics and Physics at Charles University, and two students with that name attended the school at the time. Neither were harmed during the demonstration. The government's attempt to dispel the rumor by presenting the two Martin Smiths on television failed to convince the public. Massive protests ensued, leading to O's arrest for spreading false rumors, and the motive behind the original gossiper's fabrications remained unclear, with people suggesting that she invented the story or may have been influenced by a covert operation to manipulate public sentiment. However, people have never found any um, proof of this happening or this Martin Smith dying in these protests. Claude Emile John Baptiste Leader Claude Emile was a fictional character created by Kenneth Woolner. This is the guy on the left in the picture you're gonna see. And this was to support using a capital L for leaders. So to explain, the international system of units only allows a capital letter to be used when a unit is named after a person. And this is to avoid confusion with similar characters both lowercase l and uppercase l are permitted for leaders now. Woolner's April Fool Day hoax published in Kemp 13 News claimed that Claude Leader proposed a unit and was born in 1716. With this fictional contribution later adopted into the international system of units after his supposed death in 1778. The hoax was initially presented as fact in Chemistry International and then later retracted. Lene Kikua Lene Kikua is a fake online persona created by a girl named Naya and this was from the Netflix documentary Untold the Girlfriend Who Didn't Exist. It was a huge catfishing scheme that targeted Monte Teo who was a football linebacker who believed in the existence of Kekua. In January 2013 it was exposed that Kekua was just a fake you know catfish online personality and Naya confessed to creating this fake account while exploring her own you know, her own identity, let's say. And Teo, deceived by this online relationship, was led to believe that Kekua had died and passed away due to leukemia in September 2012. This scandal eventually unfolded as Teo became more famous and his career thrived. And people eventually discovered that Lene Kekua was actually a girl named Diane Omiera. And her pictures were used in this fake profile. Unbeknownst to her, and she had no connection to Teo as well. So she eventually got on like news broadcasts and shared her story and how she's like caught off guard by all this. And Teo just went back to his football career. And I don't think the two have ever met or even talked to one another despite all of this happening. And the catfish just returned back to her normal life. She suffered no consequences. You know how this goes. Kazuo Uzuki. Kazuo Uzuki was a fake baseball player that was introduced to a Topps baseball card as an April Fool's Day prank on February 6, 2008. I don't know how that works, but I guess it did. The card featured a high school standout known as the Uzi with impressive stats, including a purported 104 mile per hour pitch. In reality, the person who was on the card was actually just some guy named Sensen Lin who was a law student at NYU. The card highlighted Uzuki's potential as the first Japanese high schooler to enter U.S. professional baseball. And this dude even became a collector's item, trading for $10 to $15 on eBay. This fake player just gained a lot of attention, but people, I mean, come on now, that can only last for so long. Helen and Petrie. So for this entry, the link that the creator of the iceberg provided leads to a deleted Wikipedia page. So I wasn't able to get anything on this entry. Same for Eduardo Corocchio, same thing here. His Wikipedia page has been deleted and that's really th what the creator of the iceberg linked for me to reference for this iceberg. So we just have to skip those two. Gerard Bostock. Gerard Bostock is a character who was featured in the album packaging of the Jethro Tull album, Thick as a Brick, and in Ian Anderson solo albums, Thick as a Brick 2, and Homo Eraticus. Rose Salabi. So Marcel Duchamp created Rose Salvi 
as this mysterious female persona using wordplay as a central element of her character. She first emerged in 1920, but gained a second role in her name in 1921 to make her stand out. She first started off as, I guess, Marcel's alter ego that he would use in photographs of himself. And then eventually he took it a step further by giving the credit of some of his works in writing to Rose Salabi. So all in all, I guess Rose Salabi was used to explore ideas of identity and self-representation while taking a different approach to his art, writing, and forms of expression. Ernst Bettler. Ernst Bettler is a fake Swiss graphic designer created by Christopher Wilson in a 2000 hoax article published in Dot 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 magazine. According to this story, Bettler designed advertisement posters for the non-existent Swiss pharmaceutical manufacturer P plus H in the 1950s, and supposedly, Bettler embedded the word N-A-Z-I into the posters as a subversive act against P plus H's alleged involvement in the NZ's concentration camp experiments. The hoax also claimed that the public outcry following the display of these posters led to the downfall of P plus H. Although P plus H never existed, that's just what the entire article is about. In reality, the narrative, including Ernst Bettler, P plus H, the Swiss towns mentioned, everything mentioned in the article is fake. Though it's fake, it did gain a lot of recognition in tons of graphic design circles, with some praising it as a notable design intervention. Eventually, this hoax was exposed in 2002 by Andy Crudson, and as time went on, people just forgot about it. Super Dave Osborne. Super Dave Osborne is a comedic character that was created by Bob Einstein, and he's usually depicted as this optimistic but consistently unsuccessful stuntman who endures comical injuries during elaborate stunts gone wrong. Super Dave often faces just getting knocked out and <laughs> just, just a bunch of dumb stuff. Look it up. It, it's like a Tom and Jerry Looney Tunes type of ordeal. He just gets handed L's consistently. The character is usually recognized by his signature logo, featuring a drawing of his head and a crash helmet atop crushed silver boots. This is supposed to like illustrate his crushed body between the boots and the neck, kind of indicative of his failures as a stuntman. And he even has a sidekick named Fuji Hakaito, and he goes on adventures with him here and there. I can talk about this guy for a while, but to basically sum it up, he's a real life stuntman looney tunes character whose gags are to mess up his stunts holy maid of leo minister the holy maid of leo minister named elizabeth was believed to have been placed in a rude loft above the chancel of the priory of leo minister by its prior in the late 15th or early 16th century one of those two they asserted that elizabeth a divine figure could survive without regular foods or drinks sustaining herself solely on ongo's food or, in other words, communion bread, that miraculously reached her mouth during Mass. Margaret Beaufort, mother of King Henry VII, I think, infiltrated an investigation into cases like that of the Holy Maid. Despite gaining a following for her supposed miraculous abilities to survive in such a manner, people just started believing that she was either a witch or she was just BSing, and examination of her living quarters revealed evidence challenging her saintly claims such as a horrible odor, hidden meat bones, and a wire connecting her loft to the altar. In response, Margaret ordered Elizabeth's removal from the chapel, and Elizabeth later admitted to being the prior's mistress, leading to both receiving public penance as a punishment. Reuben Malik. Reuben Malik is a fictional character and anti-hero in a novel called Hero on a Donkey, and he's described as a tragic comical anti-hero where he's supposed to be portrayed as a blend of Don Quixote and Soldier Schweik, combining elements of both of these characters without the resignation of the former and I guess the wise cracking wit of the latter. And this character started to gain popularity in 1995 when a Yugoslavian war correspondent initiated a hoax about the name of this character. He told an American journalist about a fictional war criminal named Grubin Malik, who was alleged to have committed numerous crimes, such as uh, all the above, literally everything bad you can think of, Grubin Malik did it, and he convinced the American journalists this, so you knew it was just going to end bad. And as his story gained traction, 
leading Judge Richard Goldstone in the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia to include Malik on a list of Serbian war criminals. The hoax was eventually exposed. People ended up just connecting the two together. But the charges on the fictional character stood on him until 1998. But eventually they removed that as well. Everybody started to pick up the fact that Grubin Malik was a guy from this novel and they realized that they all got played. Amelia Bedella, Cameroon. So Amelia Bedella is a character. She's a real fictional character with her own books and stories. This entry is about a rumor about Amelia Bedella that basically made her into her own character. So this hoax originated in 2009 when Grantland writer Molly Lambert and her friend Evan, both college students, edited the Wikipedia stage for the children's character book Amelia Bedella. They falsely claimed that Amelia was inspired by a French colonial made in Cameroon, and they did this by referencing her extensive hat collection. In this fictional narrative, included details like Amelia being named after a region in North Africa and having ties to a pharmaceutical company. It was meant to be a joke, but everybody took it serious, and this information stood on Wikipedia for over five years. And then it resurfaced in 2014, I believe, when a New Yorker.com editor tweeted a screen grab of the Wikipedia entry, initiating a wave of citations and references and various articles, blogs, lesson plans. They just basically redid Wikipedia because everybody was starting to see that Wikipedia can be edited by anybody and all these articles on Wikipedia haven't been checked for a while. So they just uprooted Wikipedia with that alone, basically. With that, guys, that ends off part two of the non-existent iceberg. Thank you guys for listening. I appreciate it. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe as I will greatly appreciate it. And with that being said, I will catch you all in the third final complete part of this iceberg. Have a great day, guys. Take care. Peace out. Welcome to the final part of the non-existent iceberg. And I have to preface this part with the fact that this tier list is one where the entries become more and more obscure as we continue down the list. And since this is a tier list about people who never existed, well... That all culminates into these final tiers having little information, almost none, or their only source of information being wiped off the face of the planet due to being a hoax before I could even get to them. So hopefully I hope you guys can understand that some entries will be skipped or way shorter than usual due to this. With that being said, let's finish this up. Starting off the video with tier 6, we have Joachim Raphael Boronali. And Raphael Boronali was a fictional Italian painter who was created by writer and critic Roland Dorgales. What Roland did was tie a paintbrush to the tail of a donkey named Lolo. And Lolo would just paint on a blank canvas and make paintings. And then Roland would go ahead and attribute these paintings to this non-existent person who was Joachim. And I'm sure that he was even able to sell a piece for about $1,200. So he was finessing people with this. However, people did find out it was the donkey painting these or I wouldn't be telling you guys about this today. Andreas Karavis. So Andreas is a fictional Greek poet who was fabricated by Canadian poet David Solway. In 1999, Solway wrote an article for Books in Canada presenting Karavis as a reclusive fisherman poet born in 1932 on Chania Crete and now living on Lipsy, which is apparently an island. Soe claims to have met Karavis in 1991, and then he was translating his poems since 1993. And the hoax involved like a whole biography, a disrupted education on Serifos, a fishing career on Amorgos, and acclaimed works like the Dream Masters and White Poems. I mean, th this was pretty well done. Usually the people who are like big names in the industry and official always make the best and most believable hoaxes this is one of them and it gained traction a lot of people fell for it but eventually Solway admitted in 2001 that Caravis was just an invented alter ego that was supposed to inspire his already existing poetry and future poetry Darko Maver so Darko Maver was a fictional artist created by Eva and Franco Matiz in 1998 and I guess his deal was that he was the center of a narrative set against the backdrop of former Yugoslavia during its war. The duo described Maver's early work as life-size sculptures supposedly created from wax, rubber, and fabric. 
He actually had notable pieces, but I don't think I can show them on YouTube because it'll get me in trouble. Um, basically, details about these pieces were gruesomely realistic puppets of victims of crime, uh, user imagination, or you can just look up Darko May vs. Art and you'll see them. And it is essential for me to reiterate that these were made from rubber, fabric, and wax. So everything you'll see in the pictures is fake, false, just artistic recreations of crimes so don't get scared when you see them and darko met his demise in april 1999 during the nato bombing while in prison in podgorica and the widely circulated photo depicted his alleged death was later revealed to have been taken in the artist garrett in the center of bologna following this fabricated demise exhibitions were staged for him culminating into a showcase at the 48th venice Beniale. And subsequently, Eva and Franco Matez eventually publicly disclosed that Darko never existed and everything about him was just a fabricated story. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you can only guess how mad the whole world was with this. Amy Iguchi. Amy Iguchi was a Japanese idol who was introduced as the supposed newest member of the pop group, well, idol group. AKB48 in June 2011. She was described as a 16 year old who was born on February 11th, 1995, who came from Saitama, which is in Tokyo. And she gained attention through media appearances, including even a feature in the weekly Playboy and a television commercial for a confectionery company called Izaki Glico. However, people began to suspect that she was a CGI composite, and this was actually the truth. It's actually kind of shameful that they did this and eventually they took her off of the official website as a trainee for akb48 lucy and yahoo dragon man so in 2005 a romanian newspaper called libertadia published a story about the birth of lucy and yahoo dragon man. and they claimed that he was named after the popular web portal yahoo we all know what yahoo is even if it's kind of outdated to this day and this article reported that he was born in December 2004 in Medias, Romania, to parents no new in Cornelia Dragoman. And this narrative suggested that the parents who met online had a virtual relationship for three months before meeting in person. And the mother, to reinforce this, is quoted as saying, We named him Lucian Yahoo after my father in the net, the main beacon of my life. Eventually, like all other stories on here, people found out that this was a bunch of nonsense but it still got people's attention. Bellatus. Bellatus first published in Paris in 1894, claimed to be translations of poems by a woman named Bellatus, a contemporary of Sappho. And the poems openly explored lesbian eroticism and caused a sensation because, you know, if people just discovered an intact cache of poems from this unknown Greek poet that we never kept record of, it would have been miraculous for history. However, Bellatus turned out to be a clever forgery by somebody named Pierre Louis, who posed as the translator of these poems. And Louis was pretty well versed in the classics, so what he did to verify these poems was include fake supporting works in the bibliography and incorporate quotations from real poets like Sappho to enhance credibility. Despite this all being fake, Bellatus retained literary value and gained cultural significance for the lesbian community inspiring organizations like the Daughters of Bilitis in the United States. Wench Tuttle. So it's either Wench or Wrench Tuttle. I think it's really Wench Tuttle. But Wench Tuttle is a fictional character who was introduced in Bob Wiseman's 1989 concept album, In Her Dream. Presented as a poet, traveler, activist, and philosopher, Wench Tuttle is a creation within the album's fictional conceit. And according to the album's storyline and the lyrics, the lyrics are derived from letters purportedly written by Wench Tuttle and sent to Bob Wiseman. For example, In Her Dream, which is the song within the album of In Her Dream, it explores a fantasy where Wiseman receives letters from Tuttle, who at the time is living in Atlanta and studying movement classes. The album combines heavy-duty political protests with rollicking folk to rock tunes. No matter how much I describe it, I can't describe it. Go hear it yourself. But Wench just seems to serve as a narrative device in Bob Wiseman's album. And that's all they really are. Johnny the Celestial Comet Chung. 
So Johnny the Celestial Comet Chung is actually quite the unique entry. You can probably pick that out from his name. But he was recognized as the Celestial Comet who garnered fame as a college football standout in 1941 while playing for the Plainfield Lions. Reports just hyped up his athletic prowess with some accounts possibly embellishing his achievements like scoring a 47 yard run and overpowering multiple tacklers all at the same time. Under the guidance of head coach Ralph Hurry Up Ho Blitzel and utilizing an innovative Wayne W formation, the Plainfield Lions with key players like Boarding House Smithers and take note of this name, Morris Newberger, experienced success. However, unforeseen challenges, including academic issues, led up to the team forfeiting their last two games, just marking an unexpected end to their winning streak. However, this all ended up being a hoax by Wall Street worker Morris Newberger. And honestly, bro just wanted to see if he could dupe the newspapers and reporters since he knew that none of them ever attended any of the games and he absolutely succeeded for a while and he sent them an entire fake schedule and everything. It's really funny how hard he finessed these guys. But yeah, that was the entire story of Johnny the Celestial Comet Chung. He's made up. All the players are made up all of his games are made up but tons of people believe them and even the news reporters did because again they don't even show up to the games they report on gregory namoff so gregory namoff is another one of these entries that only links to a wikipedia page and has no information behind it so it'll have to be skipped and sadly the same thing applies to a wreck hugh bruce cunningham so the reverend hugh bruce cunningham was a Scottish Dominion minister who was known for a colorful yet ruthless demeanor. He faced excommunication from the Pope due to charges of heresy and inflicting significant casualties in battle. But what made him stand out as a hoax and made people like notice that he was a hoax is that he and his son apparently declined knighthoods offered by King George III and this potentially marked one of the earliest instances of someone rejecting a British honor. And I guess the people with British history in the back of their heads instantly saw this as a red flag to the article and suggested it for deletion and by proxy made Hugh Bruce Cunningham a non-existent person. Abu Ali Urbuti. Abu Ali is a notable Egyptian Muslim sheikh who was recognized for many things in this world, such as his anti-American stance and his support for Khalid Islambouli this guy was the assassin of the Egyptian president, Mohammed Anwar al-Sadat in 1981. And Abu Ali was originally a pacifist championing nonviolent change within the Muslim world, but he underwent a profound transformation after enduring persecution by the Egyptian government. And this experience led him to embrace his advocacy for terroristic jihad, marking a stark departure from his earlier commitment to nonviolence. Urbuti just has a long story a very long story and i'm gonna be honest all of it just lacks citations and you think somebody who's supposedly involved in history as much as this guy does has any references but he doesn't and that's why people don't know if he exists or not however nobody has called him a hoax but people are still debating whether or not he exists on wikipedia to this day gaius flavius antoninus so gaius was purportedly an assassin of Julius Caesar and this guy got his article deleted because he was just obviously a hoax you would think after so many years we would have all the assassins of Julius Caesar named so people just aren't gonna believe a random guy coming up and being listed as one of Julius Caesar's assassins at this point However, you can get some interesting information out of the conversations that was left up on the page. And people were saying that he had been confused for someone else in the play. But um, we don't really know, right? The people who add like fake entries onto Wikipedia just disappear after doing so. So we'll never get the answer to that. Mrs. Trellis of North Wales. Mrs. Trellis of North Wales is a character who's featured in the radio comedy show. I'm sorry, I haven't a clue. And Mrs. Trellis is a regular contributor to the show, and she's known for writing these kind of funny letters to the show that just involve playful commentary on whatever the show is talking about at the moment. 
and she's become well known as a recurring character on this show we have another character from this show actually coming up so yeah i guess this is like a popular thing in the uk eric Heinemann. so eric Heinemann is one of the lucky few who got deleted on wikipedia but he made it on the web archive so i still have some of his information Eric Hyman was apparently born in Kent, Czechoslovakia, and then he later moved on to Prague at the age of 19 to pursue studies at Charles University. He graduated in 1885 with doctorates in mathematical studies and a bachelor's in electrical engineering, and then he utilized his expertise to get a teaching position at Charles University. And while teaching, he expanded his knowledge and shared insights through pamphlets that would be distributed to students. What was in these pamphlets, I don't know, let's just assume electrical engineering and mathematical study stuff and then it wasn't until 1896 that he gained recognition for his work because he got teacher of the year and got a huge salary increase from charles university and then in 1903 he moved to the united states working at yale university and he worked there until november 1913 until he passed away to a severe case of meningitis and yeah that was his entire life story so guys, from here on out, we're going to get a bunch of these fake life stories that pop up on Wikipedia. Not to say they're not interesting, but you just got to ask yourself, what do these people do with their free time? With that being said, let's move on. Alice Squillis. So Alice has a deleted page as well, but from what I could find of Alice, she was apparently a fake Wikipedia page of an author whose book won the Golden Kite Award in 1996. But obviously, since she doesn't exist, the book never existed, nor did she ever win the award. Clyde McKnight. This guy was a singer who apparently was so talented that he caught the attention of the music industry and released a mixtape called Clyde McKnight The Bachelor in 2013. And then fast forward to 2020, he made a strong return with his single Smooches, which was produced by Bangladesh and Sean Garrett. And this set up the stage for his debut album, which collaborated with a lineup of just renowned producers, including Harmony Samuels. And the album never even released in the first place. This is obviously a hoax because there's no references, sources, nothing like that. It's just somebody's dream music career. Vitas Sebastian Barbaro. So on the royalforms.com, which is apparently a form discussing historical royalty in terms of people, there's somebody talking about a guy named Princely Count Vitas Sebastian Barbero. In his particular branch of the Barbero family adopts Albergo as their surname. And if you guys haven't picked up on it yet, this is supposed to be somebody who fits in the history but was forgotten due to him being this unrecorded cousin's uncle's husband's mother. But I guess people in the UK don't play about their history because they tore this person apart and debunked him fairly quickly after these posts were made. Lang Rockin. Lang Rockin is a deleted Wikipedia page. Again, there's so many of these on this iceberg, but from what I could gather from the comments about the deletion of this article is that he was the person who was notable for attacking several women in 1893 and was said to be mentioned in the autobiography of Cher Nerman. But even in the three volumes with around 1,000 pages in total, there isn't a single instance of him ever being mentioned, yet a page existed for him. Anaxifilis. This leads to another deleted Wikipedia page. However, judging from the comments made about the deletion, it was an art piece that lasted for three years on Wikipedia before being called out as a hoax. By the way, I couldn't even find the piece, so the one on screen is just one I grabbed off of Google Images. Francis Bunbury. Despite the detailed architectural and personal history outlined in his supposed stub, Francis is all false and he was created by Oscar Wilde in this play, The Importance of Being Earnest. In the play, Bunbury is a figure used by Algernon Moncrief as an imaginary and valid friend, allowing Algernon to escape social obligations and indulge in his whims under the pretext of visiting Bunbury. So yeah, this guy is just a narrative device, nothing more really. Marathonius Granthius. So this is one of the Wikipedia hoax entries that didn't really get preserved, but every single piece of edit history behind it was preserved, allowing me to string up something of a story out of Marathonius Granthius. So here it is. Marathonius seemed to be a Roman legion commander, and he was known for overseeing the construction of the Hadrian's Wall in 122 AD. Despite his achievements, 
His legacy is marred by a reputation for excessive debaucheries leading to his disgrace. He was known for his joyful demeanor despite this in his penchant for wine and his brother Stevelis Philippus served as a lieutenant in this legion. And yeah, that's all I could really get out of the edit history. So let's move on. Rich Bradford. Rich Bradford is a made up New Mexico football player on Wikipedia who was said to be nominated for the Outland Trophy in 1984. But there was never a player by the name, nor did New Mexico ever participate in a bowl game during this time period. So it was completely debunked. What made this entry hilarious is the fact that whoever made this up went and edited tons of other articles relating to this time period in football in general in order to support this hoax and make it seem way more credible. But of course, these Wikipedia soldiers caught on and somehow figured it out. Vonda Vardera. Vonda Vardera is a Russian French American painter who was considered to be the most influential female artist of the 20th century. However, people called it out because nobody knows who she is, although she's supposedly the most influential in the 20th century. I think whoever made this person up just wasn't really trying to trick anybody and reality was just pretty bored. Victor Escobar. So Victor Escobar was a Colombian born person who gained attention due to the circumstances surrounding his disappearance and then the investigation that came after. The story goes as such, at the age of 24, he became the youngest student ever admitted to the School of the Americas, which was a training facility in Fort Benning, Georgia. In July 1999, his disappearance prompted an investigation that uncovered the use of torture manuals in the training at the School of the Americas. The revelation of torture manuals being employed in the training facilities brought to light through the unresolved case of Victor played a significant role in the U.S. House of Representatives' decision to pass a bill restructuring the school into the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation. Despite these developments, Victor's case remains unsolved and the impact of his disappearance is reflected in ongoing efforts such as that bill. This entry doesn't necessarily state that Victor is a hoax, but it's another one of those that says there's no references or sources and that it actually needs attention from an expert on this subject before they call it a hoax. So whether or not he should be on this iceberg can be disputed, but he most likely is a non-existent person. Philodopides. Philodopides is supposed to be an ancient Greek poet whose existence came into question on Wikipedia. Another one of these. The debate surrounding this article centers on suspicions that it may be a hoax because all of the supposed references for Philodopides do not really contain him when you examine the references. So yeah, they're still debating on whether or not he's a real thing. He most likely is going to turn out to be non-existent. With that being said, we close out tier 6 and move on to tier 7. No more wasting time. Jason Waterfalls, there's nothing here for Jason Waterfalls, not even a deletion article, so we know it's only going to get worse from here. William Henry Farrow. So this entry is a unique one from a Twitter post where someone actually admits that they made this person up on Wikipedia in 2004 and that he survived a long time on there. It explains that William Henry Farrow was a physician born and trained in England and he trained in Montreal, Quebec and Toronto, Ontario. He's most notable for providing one of the first detailed descriptions of synesthesia and he reported the details of this illness in an article published in the Lower Canada Journal of Medicine. I'm sure he's been taken down though as this Twitter post was made in 2020. Maddie Fairthorne All I can find is that Maddie Fairthorne lived from 1932 to 2001, was a US banker even serving as the president of World Bank from January 1985 to March 1988. but. That's it really. I'm guessing that the person just made all this up because there's no sources, you know, the usual Wikipedia spiel. Amelia Daring. Amelia Daring comes from a blog of the namesake and there's only one post from said blog, which is from a person who says that their name is Cherry and that they're the granddaughter of the famous poet, Amelia Daring, and that she has a poem for us, which is displayed down below. Amelia is obviously non-existent because this is the only record of her existence a random blog post. Erica Feldman. Erica Feldman is the first instance of a person being known as the inventor of the hair straightener, but the way she was discovered of being a hoax seems to be from someone changing her as the one who invented the hair straightener to someone named Ian Gutgold on Wikipedia for some reason. 
And then, Ian's story was found to be a hoax due to no references, and by proxy, this made Erica Feldman a hoax. I guess the person who put her on an iceberg chose her instead of Ian because she was the original incarnation of the hair straightener hoax. Count Vladimir. Count Vladimir was the last owner of the Chwekochov estate near Kazan and was a Russian nobleman. The estate had a huge forest, lakes, waterfall, farms, a mine, everything. And Vladimir passed away from pneumonia in 1866. And when he bequeathed the estate to his wife, family discord ensued and the Grand Palace met a fiery end in 1868. And the estate was eventually abandoned. The true identity of Count Vladimir's family remains shrouded in mystery because of wartime migrations and name changes just stirring up the pot. Nobody really knows what Count Vladimir's real name is or his family. So that's why he's on this list. The people do exist, but the identities do not. Jack Robichaux. So Jack was a serial R-word who plagued the town of New Orleans and his primary victims were overweight females. The text says that he was a Creole who was talented as a renowned jazz musician until his crimes became well known. He was said to originate from the book Local Matters, Race, Crime, and Justice in the 19th century South, but since he's on this iceberg, I assume that he just never really was in the book and somebody made this whole article up about him. Jonathan L. Langer Jonathan L. Langer is a character with a diverse background spanning the military, Navy, Yale, CIA, and Goldman Sachs. His existence is called into question because, obviously, come on now, who is doing all of this and not even having some kind of online verification or reference? Somebody like this should be all over the internet and he's not, so people instantly shut it down and call it a day. Altamont Lemigna and Alain de France are both completely wiped off the planet. Nothing but deletion logs exists for these two, so I couldn't find any information on these two entries. Lucas Perrick, from what I can find, he's a made up member of the Order of the Solar Temple, which was a cult from all the way back in 1984. If you want to find out more about that cult, go check my cult leader's iceberg shameless plug. However, anything about him was wiped from the article provided since he never existed. So exact specifics on this guy are unknown. And articles like the Order of the Solar Temple, really big and really controversial articles, you can't edit those and get away with it very long because people are always watching things like that. You can edit some no-name NBA player from 10 years ago, right, and probably get away with it. But something like the Order of the Solar Temple, which was a big cult with a lot of controversies, no way you're getting away with that. Nick Emshar. So Nick was said to be mayor of Mandale, North Carolina. But Nick never really existed. Jonathan Byrne. Jonathan Byrne was a person who was added to Timothy Treadwell's Wikipedia article as somebody who founded Grizzly People alongside him and Jewel Palovac. If you guys don't know, Timothy Treadwell is the man who was tragically deleted and eaten by a brown bear on audio recording and has a longer reputable history with living alongside them and researching them as he was able to do so for about 13 seasons straight. There's way more information about this on YouTube if you wanted to search for it, but it's pretty sad. But yeah, there's really nothing else about Jonathan Byrne except for the fact that he was an American Gladiators participant, but there's no history of this man being on that show or as a part of the Grizzly people. Frisriora Dalshadstein Dalshadstein was an edit into Adam Mickiewicz's Wikipedia article, being stated to be one of two philosophers who influenced Adam in 1841. That's about it really. All there is to him is a slick yet brief mention in another person's article. Don Mean, completely eradicated from the internet. Maxim Lazarev. Maxim Lazarev is a distinguished Russian educator and entomologist. He got a PhD in 2013. The man has a crazy resume, but people just called it out as nonsense. And the entire submission on the Wikipedia was declined, not even deleted. It was declined before he could even make it on the Wikipedia. And come on, let's look at the picture they submitted. Come on now, nobody's gonna believe that. Amhaya Kirtes. Amhaya Kirtes originates from an unsourced Spanish Wikipedia article. So Kirtes seems to read like some sort of ghost story rather than an actual person, where Kirtes hid inside of a basement for a month during the German invasion and occupation. But since Germany ended up occupying where he was, he ended up staying in the basement for much longer than a month. 
And then in this story, the scene shifts to him being stuck in the attic after some time. And due to this, he died due to starvation. Kirtes, before passing away, wrote a lot of texts on the wall of the attic about the existence of God, human suffering, nirvana, things of that nature. And a couple years later, a German official took over the building and remodeled it completely. But a week after, the painting on the walls that Kirtes left began to show through the walls after all the remodeling was done. And the officer left the building soon after because, quote unquote, strange things happened in there. People got this taken down, but it's not really supposed to be a entry about a person, but more so a ghost story. Despite that, it still doesn't belong there. Julien Gustave Duroy. Julien was said to be a writer for the French newspaper Le Monde on his article, but that's really it. More than likely just a fake edit for someone's amusement. Yuri Gadyukin. Yuri is the creation of a Fox documentary project that was made by British filmmakers Gavin Boiter and Guy Ducker. These guys dedicated years to crafting a fabricated narrative around this director. They went to great lengths to establish a false online presence for God you can, including pages on IMDb, Wikipedia, and Facebook. It even came to a point where a playwright even inquired about the director with hopes of staging a biography. And this time around, I believe this is the first instance of two official filmmakers, artists, etc being caught rather than exposing the hoax themselves because wiki editors kind of put everything together and figured out that Yuri did not exist. Pierre Dupont Pierre Dupont was a hoax created as part of a much more massive hoax called ART Quarterly. And ART Quarterly was supposedly an art journal that contained many artists in their work but when people investigated Art Quarterly they found a PDF to the paper was hosted on tastykinky.com which claimed to be online real estate for web-based art projects. And upon even further investigation into this journal, they found out that not a single person mentioned in this art quarterly ever existed, including Pierre Dupont. Chu Chi Zui. Based on the article provided, Bishop Chu Chi Zui is portrayed as a satirical character, supposedly a significant figure in the Chinese patriotic Catholic church, and he's described as a prominent canon lawyer Bishop Chu dedicated 68 years to improving relations between the Chinese Patriotic Catholic Church and the Vatican. And I was able to kind of structure this in a way where it sounds a little bit serious, but the real text is as dumb and all caps and stupid and funny. And the illustration of this character is Mao Zedong. So don't take it serious. It's all satirical and fake. Brian L. Friedman. Brian is a distinguished American dancer and choreographer, and he was well known for his contributions to the world of dance. He swiftly rose to prominence as he grew up, and he was under the guidance of esteemed mentors such as Joe Tremaine and Twyla Tharp. He even had collaborations with Michael Jackson, and I can go on and on and on about this entry, but we all know it's fake because the moment that somebody says they have a collaboration with Michael Jackson, it's sure to have a reference towards it in this has no references of Michael Jackson at all. No collaboration, no music, etc. So we know that this guy does not exist. Conchobar Matt Conroy. So Conchobar's reference was completely deleted, but apparently this man's hoax lasted so long, he made it onto the list of modern extreme longevity claims, which are claims that lasted longer than 130 years from the 14th century onward. Strange criteria, but I'm sure there's a good reason behind it. Gulab A. Khan. Gulab A. Khan is part of a hoax biography. He's supposedly an individual with an educational background claiming attendance at institutions such as Le Rose, Eton, Trinity, Stanford, and Hartford. And the biography alleges that Gulab was a highly successful venture capitalist with a net worth of $3 billion and the founder of Gulab Khan Capital Partners. Purportedly, one of the world's leading venture capital firms known for investing in major companies like Apple, Cisco, and Google. And people call this a hoax because all of his success, and again, no references, no articles, nothing like that, just like many of the other entries on the list. George Clemens. George Clemens was an American cinematographer, and he was said to have worked on The Twilight Zone and 12 O'Clock High in his talent in cinematography was recognized with a Primetime Emmy Award in 1961 for his work on The Twilight Zone. 
This accolade marked one of the highlights in his career, showcasing his skill and capturing the visual essence of this series. Additionally, he earned three more Emmy nominations, further solidifying his reputation as a distinguished cinematographer in the television industry. But this guy's not real. He never worked on the Twilight Zone, and that's exactly how people were able to spot that he never really existed. Sven. Sven is another character from Sorry I Haven't a Clue, like Mrs. Trellis of North Wales. But I believe Sven was more prominent in the show as he's more of a host rather than just a running gag. Despite him being a host on the radio, he doesn't really exist. Now we leave tier 7 and finally enter tier 8, the last tier. So before we even get into this tier, I need to tell you guys that first, this tier is shorter than most tiers. And second, I expect to have even less information on them than I did with previous tiers. With that being said, let's finish this up. Cruz Thompson. Cruz Thompson is a guy with just a crazy entry. I'll quickly summarize it. So he was born on 9-11-2001, and then the article just lists tons of allegations towards him, including being a national war criminal responsible for acts such as stealing band-aids from children, all the way to bombing the Capitol building of northern Afghanistan. And then this all takes a turn when it introduced mayonnaise to his life, and he declares that mayonnaise made him change his heart, and it literally saved his life. And he has a newfound passion for just obsessing over mayonnaise day and night, eventually even creating a cult known for extreme actions, surpassing even the KKK in terms of brutality and racism, all for the sake of mayonnaise. It didn't take a rocket science to figure out that this was all nonsense. Christopher James Ridley Christopher James Ridley was born on December 2nd, and he stands as a luminary within the women's suffrage movement and beyond his role as an activist, Ridley delves into the profound connection between art and existence, dedicating tons of time to unraveling this interplay and his unique philosophy that he created himself. Christophology is not a static construct, but a dynamic and living worldview that permeates every facet of his being. This is how it's described on his page. Now, this gets convoluted. Christophology is quote unquote Ridley's invitation to perceive the universe not as an abstraction, but as a collection of microscopic atoms. And through this cosmic perspective, the ordinary becomes the extraordinary. Ridley actively engages in the cosmic dance, intricately interwoven with the fabric of the universe, and his journey becomes a transformative odyssey, blending the struggles of the woman's suffrage movement with Christophology. And as this is one of those entries that claim to have a huge impact on history, despite nobody ever really caring or talking about it in today's age, it was easily identified as fake and by proxy, this dude's existence. Who even comes up with this stuff on their free time? Levi the Caveman Levi the Caveman was supposedly discovered near Mount Carmel in Israel in 1902, and he's supposed to be this mysterious historical figure with almost no information available. There is a 3D rendering of the remains attributed to a university in the Middle East, and this sparked interest because there were tons of similarities between Levi and modern humans, of course. The name Levi was given to the caveman due to the proximity to the region associated with the biblical figure, Levi. Unfortunately, the skeleton and the university's whereabouts have been lost over time, leaving only fragmented details. There's a lot more to it, but it's all nonsense, and the reference used was a YouTube video and a 1943 paper found at a library with quote-unquote, no online equivalent. Laurentiu Vlas Laurentiu Vlas is supposed to be a divine entity serving as the foundation of the Vlasism religion, and this religion focuses on living harmoniously with nature in the pursuit of knowledge. Vlas is supposed to be revered as a reincarnation of both Jesus and Poseidon. As a divine entity, Vlas was considered the possessor of absolute knowledge and simultaneously the protector of cats. This religion emphasizes the aspiration for a deep understanding of the world in harmony with the environment that surrounds them. And this concept combines spiritual elements from both Christianity through the association with Jesus and classical mythology through associations with Poseidon. And this article is promptly taken down due to the absurdity of it. However, it was also only in a different language, I think French. I couldn't find any English alternative of this article or anything to do with this guy. So all I could really do was translate it into English and read what I got. Earl of Aldbury. So this is more so a title 
but the Earl of Aldbury was established in 1672 for Edward Buttle, but it became extinct upon his death in 1683. As of now, there's no recognized heir to inherit the title, so this entry isn't like a purse or anything, but just a title that nobody has ever had or used except for Edward. Jason Allen Harris so this is just somebody's childhood put on the Wikipedia and was promptly taken down for just not being anything notable. The guy's story is so boring that people didn't even consider that he could be a famous person or anything like that. Mosin Saeed. So the only information I could find on Mosin Saeed is that he was quote unquote a Pakistani astronomer and a planetarium director. Except for that, Everything else about him was wiped from the article that was linked on the iceberg. James Parkhouse. This guy was another one of many hoax articles and the things that stand out about James is that he is 7'4 and married to Yoko Ono. Simra Saudi. So this is a 13 year old dynamo, a prodigy, you name it he can do it. He was a student at Centennial SciTech with an IQ of 140, his athletic prowess evident in a 30 inch vertical jump and a passion for soccer earned some recognition and even an invitation to the prestigious AC Milan soccer camp. He was a well-rounded individual who was well-rounded and being perfect at everything. He was just built different. But of course, if somebody like this existed, he'd be all over the internet and news. So obviously he doesn't. Avlor Landik de Hazelroff. This guy is just eviscerated from the existence of the internet. And I cannot find anything on him. And the link on the iceberg was just not working. He's gone. Juan Gadiel Rosado Colon. Juan Gadiel was a duplicate article on Wikipedia of Don Francisco, but the creator just replaced Don's name with Juan Gadiel's. There's nothing unique or interesting about this entry, really. It was just a name change, and it's the laziest attempt of a hoax on this entire list. Shaun Ahmed Ronak. For Shaun, I'm not even going to give my own description. Let me just read what's on my screen here. Shaun Ahmed Ronak was born in Hell. He completed his higher second degree in science section from a college in Hell. Shaun is the founder of an ordinary photography community named Shalva. However, this community and his website is still under development. Yeah, I don't know what's going on here. Jacob Kent Falls. His article simply states he is the smartest man in the universe with an IQ of 69,000. Honoru Stanley, Honoru's article is just their birthday, May 4, 2002, and it was taken down because that's all it is. Noah William Laudridson, and finally Noah with the article of I'm Noah. Ironically, I believe this guy truly does exist, but this was just a joke entry of himself onto Wikipedia, but it was taken down since he's not a notable figure. An ironic way to end this iceberg. And with that, this doozy of an iceberg has finally been completed. I am so happy to have this done so I can move on to the next one. With that said, thank you guys for watching. I really appreciate all the support recently. And with that, I'll catch you all in the next one. And hopefully the next one's more scary. You know, I like scarier icebergs. I thought this one was going to be scary, but it turned out to be more so of a history project. All right, let me let you guys go. Thank you so much for everything. Peace out.